everybody, welcome to another session of the Magic Master Summit. I'm your host, David Da Vinci, and today we have one of my, uh, one of my oldest mentors, uh, no offense on the age, Thanks. but uh, he's been around the longest and helped me out when I was probably 15 years old, and in a way I feel like I'm living his life by uh, following in the footsteps of raising my daughter on a cruise ship that's actually the sister ship to the one that he raised his daughter on. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, session, Sean Farquhar. Thanks it's for joining us you. here, man. I Super appreciate great. you coming out to Vegas to... Uh, to be part of this. I'm thrilled to be part of it. And I love the, the mention of that living the same life because it's like deja vu. You know, it, it, <laughs> when you ask me stuff and, and you have vu. conversations, it's it's very much like living it again when I had my little toddler on the ship and, and the experiences that the came The funny thing is, is, you know, when you leave someplace, people forget who you are. But that damn camera operator that's running my close-up show is like, oh yeah, Sean used to do something like this. Oh, really? Oh, oh. yeah, Hannah used to be like that too. <laughs> I, so I the it's also yeah. very cool. It's right? no, it's great. It's yeah. awesome. It's uh, it's cool to be, uh, to kind of see where my future could be, yeah. and to also for people who are maybe looking at this, who admire one of maybe what I'm doing, maybe what you're doing, maybe what somebody else is doing, and realize that they can make that connection, they can have that mentor, and they can also achieve whatever success they want and whatever they're willing to work for. And so uh, absolutely, and create an impact in somebody else's life, not just your own, but in the people around you. Yeah. So, and pretty that's, powerful tool. This is really powerful. You know, uh, when when you invited me to come here, it was the first thing I thought was, well, what would I talk about? Because uh, you gave me a list of all these people, and there's some amazing people on your list. And, yeah. Uh, first thing I said was, you know, well, I think the only contribution that I would really feel I've given to magic is adding memorability to it, uh, making your magic more memorable. And if, if anything, that's what I want, is for people to have a memory. That the camera guy remembers those right. moments really is... <laughs> I was just on a Disney ship uh, three days ago, and a couple came over to me before my show and said, Sean, I can't believe you're here. Ten years ago, we celebrated our honeymoon on a cruise ship. This is our 10th anniversary. And I'm like, how did you even recognize this? <laughs> oh, we'd always recognize. Just your voice alone. Uh, what? Is it? Oh, and that hair. And I was like, well, I've kind of tamed it down from where right. it is. And they're like, well, you're getting older. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks. And then I was thinking, maybe they've got me confused with somebody. And then they immediately went, do you still do that routine with the cards? I'm like, yeah. Do you wear the purple suit? I said, well, not as often. You know, we remember Hannah when she was just a little toddler. And I'm like, oh, my God, these people really do remember me. They do. And I started... In preparation for this, asking them, what do you remember? And I was very surprised by the comments. It was not so much about magic tricks. It wasn't, oh, you did this trick and you did that trick. It was about things I said and the moments that affected them in the show. Uh, so many magicians spend their entire life looking for that new trick, the trick that's going to make them a superstar. We're all out there trying to buy that new trick, the new illusion that comes along. That's the trick that's going to make you. And, and that's where magic dealers and magic creators right. make their money. But that's not where you're going to make it. Yeah, it's a contributing factor. Uh, uh, but there are 25 great magicians doing the same great illusion. What makes one stand out from all the rest? It's it, pink. That, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's pink and I do mine with a green handkerchief. It, no, it's, it, it, it's true though. Uh, there are acts uh, that... Think, well, if I just do it this way, it's different, I will be better. And we all go through that phase. I mean, as a kid starting out, you follow certain trends. You know, Jason Byrne was a huge influence in me uh, in the beginning, and I followed and I looked like him. My costume was bright, and I was like, oh, but mine's yellow, not blue. And, you know, and that was just kind of like, I thought that was original. And as I've evolved and listened to you and, and really listened to the audience, ultimately, um, I know who I am as a character. I know who my persona is. I know who I am more as a person the older I get, you know, because we met 17, 18 years yeah. ago. Yeah. And so it, things change. Man. And learning your character is probably the most challenging thing. Now, anything I say, you know, it, it can only be taken as this is my opinion. Yeah. There is nothing that I'm going to say is gospel. It's my gospel. It's how I've lived my life. I've given that advice to a lot of people. Yeah. And lots of them have become incredibly successful. A couple of people I've given the advice to aren't so successful, right. but maybe they didn't follow the advice or maybe my advice was bad for them. All I can say is what I'm gonna tell you is my thing. When you look at character, uh, so many people try to become something that they're not. I spent the first 25 years of my life trying to be Lance Burton. I started as Channing Pollock, moved on to be Lance Burton, and it was by a stroke of failure, uh, a moment of terrible memory that I got a character, uh, Lori and I, we thought we were successful. We were working. 
I was working yeah. all the time. I was working on cruise ships, five-star cruise lines uh, on the Saga Fjord and the Vista Fjord, doing world cruises in like 80s, 86. And, and uh, I thought I was there. I had, you know, my standard illusions, the sub-trunk, the zigzag. I did an eight-minute beautiful bird act. I had it's an amazing uh, act. If anybody's ever seen it, man, I, I hope you release it on video someday. I still, I've got a beat-up old VHS tape of it that I used to watch all the time. But Thanks. It, <laughs> yeah, it was an act and it was great. It was but, great. But it was not me. I mean, you know me. And when I stepped on that stage, that guy was not me in any way. It was me trying to be a combination of Channing Pollock and Lance Burton on stage. And I'm neither suave nor debonair. And uh, I had this opportunity. We were working, uh, flying, uh, flying around the world, joining the ship, flying to another place, joining a ship. And we were in uh, Civicevecchia, Italy. And it's a port city to Rome. And we had the night off. There was a juggler. His name was Attaboy Steve. I'll never forget it. Great little hook line. Very memorable. He uh, uh, was supposed to perform that night, and we were going off for the day. We went off, and we did what everybody does in Rome. We ate lots of pasta, drank lots of wine, and walked the streets in the sun, saw the Colosseum. And when we came back, the cruise director was frantic. We said, why? He says, you're on. I said, what do you mean we're on? Tonight's our night off. He says, no, the juggler broke his wrist. Uh, he fell down the gangway, and you're doing the two shows tonight. I said, I, I can't do two shows tonight. I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he said, go out there and do your shows. I'm like, this is not a good idea. I don't have the hand-eye coordination to do that. <laughs> no. And he said, you'll do your shows. And I went out. The guy's name was Danny Leone. He was the cruise director. And I went out, and I did the first show. And about 20 minutes into this pathetic performance of stumbling and knocking things over and um, failing in multiple spots, I just stopped and sat down on the edge of the stage and looked at the audience and said, wow, if my grandpa were alive, he'd die. <laughs> this guy goes, what? And I said, oh, you guys don't know, but my grandfather was a magician. And this is just conversational that I always had. I said, my grandpa was a magician. My grandfather, my great-grandfather. I'm the fourth generation of my family without a real job. And the audience laughed. I was like... That's funny, my conversational stuff works in a big audience. <laughs> and then the guy goes, well, why would he die? I said, well, because uh, I did what you guys did today. I went out and I <laughs> ate and drank and I, I'm drunk. And the audience <laughs> laughed. I said, no, really. I said, I, I'm not supposed to be on. You look at your little program, you'll see it says, add a boy, Steve, juggler. I'm not a juggler. <laughs> my name's not Steve. And the audience laughed. And I realized I was just being personable. I was just having a conversation with the audience. For the first time in my entire life, I was really honest on stage, just mm. being myself. I said, you want to see a trick I can't screw up? Give me a minute. And I walked off stage and Laurie looked at me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting something I can't screw up here. And I dug <laughs> through the box. They could hear me. They were laughing. I came out and I did the trick and it went really well. And then I said, let me get another one. And they went off and the audience left. And by the third one, I was pretty sober. And I did the last two effects that were in the show. And in the past, I would get what I called standing ovations, where people would stand up in groups and slowly people feel obligated and the room would all stand up and it was like nice. And it was like one out of every 10 or 12 shows. And they were okay. And this day was a leaping ovation. Yeah. So just, the entire room just went Pff! And then they all met me. I go to the back and the cruise ships in those days, still do today, I went to the back and I shake hands with people. And the amount of women that shook your hand and went, yeah, he really was drinking. <laughs> it was really fun. <laughs> but the compliments were different. Uh, in the past, they would say things like, oh, I have no idea how you did that green box. Or where the bird went to, I haven't got a clue. And they always complimented the trick. And this night, this night for the first time ever, people shook my hand, looked me straight in the eye, and said, your grandpa would be proud of you. Or, mm -hmm. wow, your dad was a good teacher. And I swelled up. My eyes were almost tearing. And I was like, what? And by the end of hearing hundreds of people, not one or two, but hundreds of people say this to you, I went, I want this show. Well, there's two shows, as you know, in a night. And so the second one, I was pretty sober. But I kind of tried to do what I did in the first show. And I Hollywooded it up a little bit. I said, hey, add this track. Put this piece of music on. I'm going to tell a little sweet story about blah, 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 blah. And I tanked. And about oh, halfway no. through the show, I was burning and falling to the ground. And it was like, and I stopped and I said, I'm sorry, folks. This is not normally the way I do my show. But let me explain what happened today. And then I stopped. And I was honest again. And I began to explain what happened during the daytime and what happened in the show before. And by the time I finished... I had them again. Mm. They weren't as great as they were the first time, but they were close. And it took about six more months being on the ship and really listening to audiences, which a lot of performers don't do. It's they tough. hear the applause, but they don't hear the audience. And the audience will tell you when you're exciting, when you're boring, when, when you're engaged, and they can easily tell when you're telling the truth or when you're telling a lie. And even a slightly fabricated one, they can begin to feel the niche to it. Yeah. If it's, if it's slightly fabricated, they'll often come to you and go, 
Was that real? And if it is and you tell them, they'll believe you because then they'll know that you're being honest. And if you are honest and say, well, it's kind of a white lie, this is the whole thing, they'll go, awesome. And they feel even more connected to you. And it took me maybe six months to therapy on stage. <laughs> right. I basically did therapy on stage and I found my character. I see so many people that still don't have a character. And it took me 21 years of my life to get to the point where I began to find it. And I'm still on an exploration because then once I found my character and I found the honesty, I then wanted to share more. I overshared. Right. <laughs> and that became a, I remember a person writing a comment going, magician should shut up about all the places he's been to and all the great things that have happened <laughs> and do more tricks. <laughs> and I was like, Ooh. It's kind of the nice thing about cruise ships because you get that feedback in those comment cards. I remember oh. in, the first time I was on Norwegian Cruise Lines, it was like 2004. And uh, Twice is Nice, you know Twice is Nice, yeah. right? Uh, he was on one of the singers for the Commodores. And, and yeah. anyway, so they're still a beautiful couple and they're out. And so we, we were working with them years ago. And they're like, don't go read, whatever you do, don't go read the comic cards. So what do I do? I'm like, oh, I need to go read the comic cards. Oh, there's my name. The magician was disappointing. Yeah. And I was like, damn. <laughs> So I've never read the comic cards again until I found my character and I started to really develop and figure out who who did who was I in real life. And as you know, granted, at 19, I didn't know who I was. And yeah. no, most people don't. I knew what I wanted to Just do. Just in life, you don't know who you are. You don't. You really. And people that are 19 and 20 listening to this now probably won't appreciate that until they're 25 and 30. But really, by the time I hit 30, I kind of knew who my stage persona was. And once I got a grasp of it and it really kind of tied into what I, what I like and who I am and what I like to do off stage, and you know, I do, I do things that are pretty uncommon for the average person. Yeah. And those things kind of translate into the show and really show who it, I am integrate. and it's those stories. And those moments become the stories. Uh, when you talk about your grandfather surviving the plane crash, this is a true moment for people and they see it, they can tell, no matter how many times you tell that story, they can tell that you're feeling it at that moment. Yeah. They don't care how much of an actor you are, they can tell the difference. And that's when they totally latch in and go, this is real. Yeah. This isn't like, oh, look, one time I was in Tibet and I saw this <laughs> shaman and you're like, really? I yeah. don't think that's real. How many people never saw snow when they were a young person? That's Every magician I've ever met. It's so sad because, you know, I'm pretty sure that Kevin James's presentation was genuine, that he met a little girl, his niece, and, and that's so great. And everybody, instead of trying to find something different, latched onto it. I have a great story of being in an audience watching a magician do the snow, and this man stood up about three people over from me, walked forward, and then slowly raised his hands and put his face into the little bubbles floating down. And when it was done, I went over and said, are you all right, sir? And he says, I'm from Malaysia. This is the first time I've ever touched snow, and it's the greatest experience of my life. It's soap. And it's just so, and I'm thinking, you can't tell him because, because it's going to destroy the relationship between that performer and him, which somehow he's believed because he's naive having never seen snow. This brings back a moment that I think everybody can remember in Frozen when they're like, should we tell him? Should we yeah. tell him? Somebody has to yeah. tell him. Somebody What's snow doing in the summer? I can't wait for summer. Somebody... But in that moment too, like it, it ties in. That's the moment where you fall in love with his character. Mm -hmm. You know, it was brilliantly written, but it's this... Vulnerability? Yeah, yeah. It, it's Somebody that has... moment that you're describing there as well. Absolutely. In, in magic, we have that opportunity to make it with almost everything. I don't think you should make it with everything. Uh, there has to be those glib moments, the fun just yeah. off the cuff. People who put too much meaning into magic can be just as bad as those who put no meaning into magic. Mm -hmm. It's if, if you do it all in one direction, you'll fail just as badly as those who put nothing into it. Yeah. But finding a combination, just like any play, there has to be ebb and flow. Uh, moments of conflict, conflict, moments of resolution. Without those, you don't have a show. You just have a, a, a railway car moving through and passing time. Yeah. We talked a little bit. I know you haven't seen the presentations, uh, but Dan Sperry and I talked a bit about his character. And I want to bring his, his example up. If they didn't see that presentation, guys, I suggest you go back and watch it. If uh, I don't know the order of how these are yet, but do check out Dan Sperry's presentation because he touches on this briefly and from such an extreme angle. I think people should really look and see, you know, love him or hate him. Mm -hmm. He, the first competition was with you in 98 yeah. in Hollywood. And he came on stage and he was in a graveyard and he did his act. And I remember seeing part of it and I, it was really weird. And I remember that. And I did my act, which was very like what I thought a magician should be. And it wasn't, it, was, it had its things. But I remember Dan was told, don't do that. Mm -hmm. 
and so he pulled back the next year. He was Lance, he was Jason, he was Greg, he yeah. was he was all of our circle of influence at that time, and he was really good. Yeah. He was really good. Very proficient sleight of hand guy, but he wasn't him. But a piece of him was missing. Yeah. And then you slowly, over the next few competitions, saw that come back. And he, Dan and I competed, and we would do first and second for our whole careers, it seems like. Um, although he got Magic Magazine cover before me. <laughs> <laughs> but, what are you complain about? I shared one right. <laughs> with my brother Shoma. <laughs> yeah, well, I well, and actually talking about the Dansbury won the Lance Burton contest, and Jessica Reed and I tied. Yeah. And so Lance is like, oh, $500 check for two second place and he rips the check in half, gives us each, and I get a $250 check in the mail. Like, wait, second place is 500. Anyway, <laughs> but at that point, Dan was really starting to create his character and, and now he's taken it to where he's kind of the same guy on and off stage. He is, uh, because it's his character, by not being false, then you ring really true on stage. And you'll notice, even though his character looks totally extreme and you think it's gonna be this really cruel, mean kind of thing, He's wacky, crazy, and fun. Uh, uh, the like lifesaver, lovable, the, and sadistic. The, the, yeah, the the bottle smash. The, I watched him do the bottle smash on the Illusionist show in Seattle, and it was almost 15 minutes long. He got to the point where he said, "Hey, you people out there have to stop reacting so well. They're going to fire me because this is too long." But the fact of the matter was, it was so brilliantly well put together, and the reaction was so strong with the audience and his connection personally. It was a memorable moment that'll last forever in the memory of any person that was in that room because. He got a heckler in the crowd and he worked with him and he won over the heckler and the audience loved the moment and because mm -hmm. of Dan's character being, don't you realize I'm mean and scary? You shouldn't be heckling me. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. It was just, it was such a strong moment because they saw that moment and they felt that whole feeling of the character. So yeah, uh, that's an extreme, but it's a great extreme. Uh, and I've seen guys who have very subtle ones. Um, uh, guys like uh, Woody Aragon and he runs his own little theater in Spain and his character is just this impish little guy who wears you know superhero t-shirts and it's a subtle character and all his stuff is you know it's going to kind of work at Danny D. Ortiz where it's not me it's you I don't care it's your life you do what you want to any person you really admire you're going to recognize a character in about 10 seconds yeah uh, the greatest compliment I've ever gotten was going to a magic convention in Bulgaria and this Bulgarian comedian got up and did impressions of 12 magicians. And I was included in the group and they got me in the first six seconds. The whole yes. I was, oh, and I was like, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it meant I had a definable character that they were easily able to identify as being me. And it wasn't like some crazy magician because there's 25 that look or act like that by being a little bit different. And so that, a lot of that, that's a goal to, to, to make you more memorable. It's important to develop a character that's true to you can be a magnified version. There's that old Bill Cosby thing, you know, uh, 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 magnify who you are. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe, say, not, maybe he's not a good example. No, he is because <laughs> he talked about cocaine and they said, uh, why do you do cocaine? And uh, he said to the person, why do you do cocaine? He said, because it intensifies uh, my personality. He said, what if you're an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, it's a perfect <laughs> example. So intensifying your personality, magnifying it on stage, uh, and not clownish, but bigger than life because you're on a stage is the way to go. And maybe you don't know what your character is, but that'll come by actually examining yourself. So what kind of tips would you have for learning who you are? Uh, first, uh, I would take a lot of video of yourself. Uh, everything that you do on stage, I would videotape. And even more, I keep the videotape running afterwards so that when I'm meeting the people, I see who mm. I am off the stage. This is the great That's advantage you and I have on ships, is that off stage, we have to be something similar, if not the same, as what we are on stage. Because if you're one thing there and another thing here, they won't ring true. And because they have a week before they fill out their comment cards, they'll know the difference. Yeah. So by videotaping yourself and seeing what you do, and, and don't go, oh, I can't believe that I always do that. No, accept it. That's what you always do. If you always do it, there are guys going, no, you should change that. I said, really, why? Because that's what makes you uniquely you. Yeah. If you want to be like all the other guys, well, then go ahead and change it. But instead, find those things that make you uni uniquely you and embrace them. Uh, embrace your inner geekness, whatever it is. Yeah. There is something. I'd start with videotape. It's a great place. Uh, I would also ask people around you, 
you know, what do you think of me? That's the hardest question you're ever going to ask. Yeah, a you don't always want to hear that. <laughs> uh, nobody wants, well, 90% of the time, you'll have people that are very kind who will only tell you the compliments. And I remember the very that's, first... It's damaging, though. It I totally think people is. really need to watch out for that. First time I went into a SAM competition in Las Vegas, Nevada, in 1991, and I walked into the judge's critique, and uh, they said, so we're going to have a few minutes to talk, and you can ask some questions. I said, great. If I can begin, what didn't you like in the show? And Billy McComb threw his pencil and said, that's why he should have won. And I went... I'm sorry. And he goes, I was just telling them that you should have won. And your question just then was the reason why. And I said, what? <laughs> that I asked what you didn't like? I assumed there was something you didn't like because when I came in the room, there wasn't champagne and balloons. So I know I didn't <laughs> win. <laughs> and everybody laughed. And they said, you're the only person out of all the competitors who came in and asked what we didn't like. And I said, oh, well, why are they here talking to you as a judge's critique if they aren't? And then uh, another judge, the they, they said, well, I really like the way you color coordinate things, and I thought it was very nice the way you, and I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I only get a few minutes, and I really appreciate your compliment, but they have no bearing on these few minutes, because everything in the show, I like. <laughs> what yeah. I need to know is, why didn't I win, so that I can change it for the next one? And her response was, well, the other guy had a big bird, and then I bought a cockatoo. <laughs> <laughs> It's a true story, which is really sad, but true. And then I won the next year. What a surprise. Um, <laughs> uh, so taking... There's another trend. Yeah, taking <laughs> negative criticism and, and not taking it negatively. So many people, when, when you're given criticism, when you ask somebody, what do you think of me? They go, oh my God, they're going to rip me apart. Yeah, well, they will. And, and you can take it negatively or you can take it positively. I have verbal diarrhea. The amount of people have said to me, Sean, you don't know when to shut up. Well, that, that, okay, is that a negative? Well, in some people's eyes it is. But in my world, it's who I am. Yeah. If I tried to change it, I'd only be stifling my character. When I get on a stage and I talk to the audience and I can do a ramble of three minutes that almost sounds like music the way I'm talking and it has some bearing to the effect, they go... That guy can talk forever. <laughs> and that's what they remember. They go, you sound, you know, you got a squeaky voice like you're Mickey Mouse being strangled or something. It's like <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and had all these as compliments and comments. And people are going, what's with the hair? I had one guy just recently say, you know, you've had that same hair since you were young. Now that you're old, don't you think you'll change it? I'm like, I should, yes. But at the moment, it defines who I am. I was yeah. one of the first to go with the spiky hair. I kept it in for years. I used to put a little blonde in it. Why? Because I wanted people to recognize me. So I did personal characteristic changes to work on my character. I wore a purple tuxedo. That was also part of character because on stage and off stage, I had light purple shirts, and purple jackets, anything. So they go, hey, that's the magic guy. And then yeah. I worked to get away from the, hey, that's the magic guy. <laughs> I wanted them to say, hey, that's Sean. <laughs> right. It's been a wonderful experiment. The last, uh, about three years. Before that, I, I lost the ability to be Sean because I was making my daughter appear on stage. I would come out, look, world champion of magic, Sean Farquhar. And I produced my daughter. And they go, look, it's Hannah's dad. And right. that became my character. And I embraced it. I went, if they're going to call me Hannah's dad, I'm Hannah's dad. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then I built my story more around the character that the audience gave me. Well, now that Hannah is in school and she's, you know, uh, about to become some billionaire in her own private industry somewhere. <laughs> I'm just hoping. <laughs> I need a retirement package. Uh, while she's at home with her mother, I have to develop my character different. And I don't think it's a compliment if people say, oh, the magician was good. When I read comment cards and it says the magi magician was brilliant or the magician was the best part of the cruise, it's not a compliment to me. It's not even a good thing. It's, it means I never connected with them at all. When they write, Sean was brilliant. Sean was a highlight of the cruise. I take that as a huge badge of honor, especially on a Disney cruise where they're with Mickey and Minnie and yeah. they're seeing Broadway shows and seeing you know the, uh, these phenomenal cast shows of 30 people and, and produced by Disney. And then I walk out on a little stage and do my act and they write, highlight of the cruise was Sean the Magician. I go, oh. Again though, because you're connecting with them. Yes. Mickey and Minnie can only connect so much. And the Broadway show is a Broadway show. Uh, I, I quite often, I don't want to make it sound like bragging, but I quite often get standing ovations. And the Broadway shows on board don't often get standing ovations. And it's not because the show's bad. The show is brilliant. It's beyond brilliant. They brilliant. haven't read Ken Weber's book, Maximum Entertainment. Absolutely. This is why. <laughs> Absolutely. Ken Weber talks exactly about it. And, and there is this, this engagement part. Uh, there's a contract between you and the audience. Mm -hmm. The difference is when you go to see a Broadway show, you admire the sets, you admire the costumes, you admire the music, the conductor, the choreographer, and 60% of the people that put that show together are not there. 
and the other 40% are performing it as directed by a director. And so they have this, I'm watching something and it's beautiful and they react and it's nice and, and it's a wonderful theater experience. But when a guy just walks out on stage and it seems bare and for some reason fills your heart, tells you some stories, you laugh, you embrace your kids a little bit more, you appreciate your grandmother, your grandfather because they say yeah. something about it in the show and at the end you feel this sense of family and then he says, I hope, just hope that maybe a part of what I've told you tonight might be a part of your life in the future. They just go, oh, let's just all stand up. Right. And, get <laughs> and, 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 and it's, a, it, it's a badge of honor. I'm not saying it's needed. It's not. But, but it happens so often now. And so that's, uh, you know, the costume idea uh, when I went to purple, I was the black tuxedo, but I was different. I had burgundy, black, white, and burgundy. I was right. different than everybody else. <laughs> and uh, I, I discovered this uh, purple suit uh, on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. Uh, yeah, Hollywood, not Sunset. On Hollywood Boulevard, down by where the Hollywood magic was. was in 98? Yeah, back in, yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And exactly when, and I went, this is awesome, I'll buy this. And it was $10 for the jacket, $10 for the pants. Wow, the next one I had custom made in Hong Kong was a lot more than $10. Right. But I bought it, I did it in a competition. Uh, and the reason I went to purple was because I progressed. It wasn't black to purple, in between was this gray and I had this uh, kind of an off blue gray. And I'd gone to a competition, IBM contest, did my bird act, and afterwards I went to the judges. I hadn't won, and I said, I'm wondering if you had any criticism for me. And the guy said, which one were you? I said, I was the guy in the black tuxedo with the doves, working with the red handkerchiefs. And he said, which one? <laughs> and having not watched, you know, 40 some competitors, I didn't know there was more than a dozen that I looked like as far as a judge was concerned. Yeah. So I changed, got this kind of a bluish gray tuxedo, burgundy silk, made my wife wear this velvet dress that looked very Rita Hayworth style and put on a bad mustache and, and out I went and did my show. But when I got to the finals and they took a picture, there were six acts on stage and five of them were in black tuxedos and this one guy stood out. And when I asked each of the judges later, do you have any critique of my act? They said, which one were you? And I said, I was in the southern gray outfit. Oh, and then immediately they could, they could yeah. tell me stuff. I stood out. When I did the uh, North American Championships, I, there's a row of, row of people all in black and one guy in purple. In fact, a person made a photograph and mailed it to me. It's a beautiful panoramic of all of them in the line and me in purple. And the, they wrote underneath, one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> <laughs> so your costume can define your character, your looks can define your character, and you as a human being define your character. That's the biggest one. I like all What that. your beliefs are, how you act off stage is just as important as you act on stage. If you're a jerk off stage, you're probably going to be a jerk on stage. If you're a powerful person on stage, you're going to be a powerful person off stage. If you're an extreme person, that does, you're, you're on stage going to be extreme too. That's just who you are. If you're a guy who just can't stop talking, that's what you're going to do on stage. <laughs> I think I've asked one question this whole time. Exactly. 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea. It's who I am. Yeah. You, you were talking a, few, a little bit. Uh, I want to come back to a name in, in the comment card. So let's not forget that, but uh, like hairstyle, you said, okay, you're a hairstyle, you're a spiky, wouldn't you like to maybe tone it down when you're 80? And the reality is you're probably gonna have this as long as you have hair. Yeah. And a lot of people that, that know me, I'm very open with the fact that I had hair transplants because I wasn't getting work because I started losing my hair pretty early and, uh, and I, I did a buzz cut. That year I didn't have any work. Yeah. No work because I looked like everybody else. And this was weird. If anybody wants to try this experiment, shave your head. Wear normal clothes, wear a t-shirt and jeans, and try to go in and be recognized by anybody. You, I looked like everybody else in the room. I became, in the survival industry, they call it being the gray man. You don't want to stand out if you're trying to blend in someplace. In the gaming industry, they call it hit man. Shaved yes. head, red tie, black <laughs> suit, look like everybody else in the group. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. And that's the, that's the point with that. But on the other side, if you're an entertainer, you need to stand out. And as soon as I, you know, I had the hair put from here to here and uh, re-spiked it and... Uh, now I was my character again, and that was part of my reestablishing who I really was. And the people on the ship, if I don't have my hair spiked, they know that I don't want to be bugged. So in a way, it's kind of nice. They still may recognize me, but when my hair spiked, I can't go anywhere. Without people coming up, want to take a picture, talk to you, it really defines you. It's, yeah. I did it with, uh, on NCL, I put white tips in the front. And when I had a dad day, I put my ball cap on, yep. and I played with my daughter at the pool, and... I was anonymous completely. Uh, the glasses make a difference. Off stage, I wear my glasses. On stage, I take them off. The amount of people that kind of look twice and they go say, 
I think it's him. I don't think he wears glasses. So I'm like, hi. They go, oh, that's his voice. Hi, yeah. Sean. They, yeah. Yeah. It, it, but having anything that distinctly marks you a little bit different in your features. Even, um, and even your hair, you know, I mean, there's a lot of uh, magicians in the industry that, that have fake hair. Um, and there's people that rhyme with Smith's Crangel who have wigs. You know, there's yeah. a lot of people that, that are, don't be afraid to be that character that maybe is really who you are. And, you know, if you, uh, like for me, my hair was a big part of it. I didn't realize until I shaved it. When, I, when that was the case, I'm like, holy crap. And my deal with, the, with Feld Entertainment was uh, Nicole Feld. I did a four-person audition. It was Kenneth Feld, Nicole Feld, my manager at the time, and a stranger. And I did my show, and I said, thank God I did the show in Saipan, where I had two people in the audience one show. Oh, it, so you, it prepared you me for this. Ready for the two. crowd was twice as large. Awesome. And so I go out, and I do the show, and I, I nail it because of some of those previous practice runs. And Nicole says, and I, I will never forget this, she turns to me, she says, we really like your show, everything was great, but I just have one question. I'm like, one question, sure. Why'd you cut your hair? And I'm like, Look, I'm bald. <laughs> and she's like, "Yeah, but it was, you know, it was really your look." And I'm like, "I'll tell you what. If you sign this contract, I'll have that. I'll one. go do Bosley." Yeah. And she goes, "Awesome!" <laughs> so awesome. I, people, he need to hear that story to understand how important your look is. If it's part of you, and that's kind of what you know, your it factor, if you will. If that's what helps you be who you are, embrace that. You know, if it means getting a wig or, or hair transplant, or if it means shaving your head and that's what makes you stand out, because there's plenty of people who look good bald, yeah. I'm not one of them. Darcy Oak, tattoos and bald, and gives a whole different look, but but it's who he is. It really you have is. to find that def definitive thing that makes you who you are. You know, uh, 30 years ago, uh, I heard Jeff McBride say something at a lecture, and it's always embraced me, and he said, uh, when you go out, Dress like you have someplace better to go yeah. than where you are. I remember hearing the same thing. It, it, it resonates every day when I see a guy come in and he, he looks like, you know, he doesn't have a dime and he's like, I'm going to make it big. And I'm like, maybe not. Maybe not. You, know, <laughs> you don't have to be dressed like you're a businessman. You don't have to dress like you're a slick willy. But you have to dress unique and defined for that market. Like Max if you're going Maven to a Renaissance Max Maven. Festival. You, yeah, you would, you would pick out Max Maven in, a, in an airport in a heartbeat. Because of his hair and the way he dresses, yeah. Eugene Berger, and the way he him. carries himself. And he, I think that's another part, another oh, level of they're, that, they're, right? Yeah, it's a hard one to explain, though. I remember at the Tropicana Hotel, I was standing waiting for World Magic Seminar, and Channing Pollock walked down the hallway. And this is thirty-five years after he was famous, but he walked like a movie star, mm -hmm. and people everywhere stopped, and people who didn't know he, who he was were bringing up their cameras. You know, that's when they had cameras, right. and they were taking <laughs> pictures. From the side and behind as he walked down because women turned to look, men turned to look, people were taking pictures, the magicians were beginning to flock towards him. They're like, well, he must be some sort of super. But he just carried himself with a whole demeanor yeah. that was just. It was him. Yeah. It was his character. Same with Max Maven. Yeah. What's Juliana you... Chen. She, when she walks into a room, she glows. As she walks yeah. into a room, she's just her superstar of herself. And, and it's not in a powerful man-like way. It isn't a very feminine, but she is a superstar. In her mind, she sees who she's portraying, and she does it. And everybody accepts it. Yeah. It's, it's very unique. Each person, you can be powerful or you can be meek. Uh, I, I've you always wanted to be that person that um, isn't arrogant. There are times when you have to use arrogance or look like arrogance when you're promoting yourself. Uh, Lord knows. It's a tough one. It is. I push the two-time world champion of magic. You don't know how sick I am of hearing that myself. Right. And somebody said, you know, you, FISM was in 2009. Don't you think you beat that horse to death? And I said, and as soon as those Academy Award winners stop saying they're Academy Award winners, I'll stop too because it's how I get a paycheck. Yeah. You know, it's uh, uh, forcing yourself to go out there. And that all comes into your character. For me, I'm Canadian, so I apologize a lot. I apologize <laughs> for apologizing. Um, it's, it's, sorry? It's, yeah, sorry. Um, you know, only Justin Bieber could put out a song called Sorry, because he's Canadian. Um, it's, and I get a hit with it. You, you, have, to, you have to look at these things. Uh, with me, I, I look at my character, and I go, well, who am I? I I'm a father now. Uh, before, I was just a guy who was very lucky to have a break because of my family and generations. And now I look going, I'm a guy who had generations of family, who uh, did magic, then I raised a daughter who has that, and I'm very blessed now to be able to perform and still support myself and love what I do. And, and 
and that the magic I do, magicians like. So lay people go, what, he fooled Penn and Teller? What, he won the world championship in magic? Not once, but twice? What, he's Canadian magician? And they, they hear all these accolades and it only makes you look bigger and ready for them to accept. But you also have to be careful not to take it too far. Because you know, when I won the world championship at FISM, people expected me to do, you know, I don't know, a fly around the room and blow flames out of right. my arse. And I was like, yeah. no, you're gonna get this show. And then they were like, well, what won you the world championship? Well, a let me card show trick. you something with a deck of cards. It's like, like, oh, that's a good card trick. And they're like, yeah. oh, okay, but but it's still a card trick. And then, yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, oh, he was on Ellen. It's like, what did you do? A card trick. Yeah. It's, it just all leads into. Um, yeah. Well, let's jump back to the name thing because you say, you know, one of the biggest things was, oh, the magician was great. No, you want people to say Sean was great. And it was a, it was a tough decision for me because I felt like it was really late. But in about 2007, 2008, I decided to go David Da Vinci. And that was the stage name. It was at a marketing conference and they were talking about Best Buy and Coca-Cola and Blackberry and Palm Pilot and these all of these companies that had branded themselves with alliteration. Yes. And for whatever reason, I was like, David Da Vinci. And I wrote it down and I looked at it and like, Rolls off David the Da Vinci. I was having, a, I did a lot of shows in Asia. And the problem was, a lot of Asia can't say Womack. At all. It, they've never heard it before, so it's forgettable. Yeah. In the States, you've maybe heard it, so it's a little different in that market. But my market wasn't just the States at the time, it was worldwide, and I would say it still is. But everybody in the world has heard the name Da Vinci at oh, some sure. point in their life. Rings a bell. The alliteration creativity. there. Creativity. Creativity. Yeah. There's flying. Invention. There's it's, power. There's yeah. there's a lot of the things that I wanted to portray. You know, the Vitruvian illustration. The guy's muscular. He's naked, but he's muscular. Yeah. You know, and these were things that I wanted to project. Not that I'm a muscular guy, but I I'm a fit person. You know, so so there was all these different things that I was like, that kind of works. And you'll notice if you go to cruisecritic.com and you look up Norwegian Dawn 2014, 15, 16, you're going to see the weeks and months that I was on there. You'll see the entertainment was great, uh, you know, or, or good or whatever they thought about the entertainment. And then they will specifically say, but David Da Vinci, and yeah. even if it's a bad comment, they remember me. They still know you. One lady said, good or David bad, Da Vinci as as and his right. so-called magic. Uh, yeah. Everybody else was very positive, but they mentioned me. And then they couldn't mention the aerial acts that had difficult names because they were from French or Portugal. or you know. And, and so having a name that matches the character and the style, that's tough to do. It took me 10 years to really find. But that and was a big part me. with them remembering. Hardcore. But then you have the Shrek joke. <laughs> I do. But Shrek joke hasn't always been there. Yeah. You're probably wondering why I changed my name. You know, my original name was Engelbert Humperdinck. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> why did I take Farquhar? I promised my parents. I really did. I said, Mom and Dad, I'll keep my last name no matter how short it makes my career. Right. <laughs> no, it, really it was like 1983. I was in um, uh, Santa Barbara, California. I had gone to a barbecue. Uh, Lee Grable was hosting this thing, and David Copperfield was there. And he actually said hello to me, and he said, uh, you're Sean Farquhar. And I was like, you know my name? He said, I, I practiced it. And I said, what? I'm thinking of changing my name. He said, why? Well, you did. And he goes, but I just practiced it. <laughs> right. I was like, oh. And it was one of those things. Uh, a few weeks later, uh, I went and saw uh, a magician in Seattle, and uh, he said, is that French? Farquhar? And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. And all these people had, and I went, I'm going to keep it, no matter how doof, doofus it may seem to people. It's unique. It's it, really unique. It is. It's, it's actually not pronounced Farquhar. It's pronounced Farker. But that sounds like I'm <laughs> picking a fight with everybody. We did a show in Scotland, and the MC said, ladies and gentlemen, one more time for Sean Farker. And let's hear it for the mother Farker. And here comes the little Farker. And, and the audience was cracking up. I'm like, is that really how you say they? Why, do you think I'd make that up? And they really do. That's how they say it, Farker. But, but I can't use that. So I went, no. a softer Farker. Not on Disney. No, no, nowhere. <laughs> I don't care. Even in a biker bar, I get beaten up going, hey, I'm, I'm the big Farker. Uh, it's, like, it's not good. But I've kept it, and I've, I've, I've found ways to make jokes about it. I say, it's yeah. Farquhar, it's Scottish for the cattle are dying. Or I say, you know, maybe you remember me. I was in the movie Shrek. <laughs> it's right. like, I'm Lord Farquhar. I'm a little taller in real life. The camera puts on pounds and makes you right. shorter. So, and green. You know, um, and now I, I'm, I'm going and I'm applying for a lordship so that I can actually be Lord Farquhar in Scotland. That's it's, funny. It's a good thing. But those are all things that you're tying back to that make your name more make memorable. My name and you're tying out. that back. In. Always pulling them back, giving them a story, giving them a reason. And, and, and I think if you spend the time to learn it, then you get it. I make a very strong point in my show about my name. Mm -hmm. I say towards the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people ask me, if I won the world championship twice, why am I on a cruise ship? Why am I not in Las Vegas? Why am I not in some Hollywood theater? Why am I not on Broadway? To be honest, I've tried those things and I didn't like them. 
I love the ship because I get to meet you, I get to hang out, I get to see you around the ship. If you see me around the ship, don't hesitate. Just come right up to me and say, hey, Sean, how are you? Can I buy you a drink? <laughs> Gets a huge laugh. I said, now don't come up and say magic boy because I'm not magic boy. I'm Sean. I have a name. Right. And they all laugh. I said, so come up and say, hey, Sean, seriously, there's a lot of you. They're going to walk by me. As soon as you walk by me, you're going to go, I think that's the magic guy. Yeah. Don't. I can hear you. <laughs> right. And they laugh. And then they come up after the show and they go, hey, Sean. And you can see them struggle the first time. Yeah. Sean, good to see you. I said, thank you. It's so nice to see you too. And by the third or fourth day of a cruise, they're all coming, Sean, how are you? And the crew says, how do they all know your name? Like, it's a game we're playing now. I've made it memorable. I've changed the game. It's not, I'm a magician. I'm Sean. Please remember my name. And the amount of people that think it's funny to come up and go, hey, can I buy you a drink? You're like, I'm fine, but thank you. It's like, <laughs> You're like, maybe this time. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of them will be at the soda fountain where it's free on Disney. Right. And they're yeah. pouring their coffee. Hey, can I buy you a drink, Sean? I'm like, I'm good. I'll get my own. But at least they said my name's Sean. And, yeah. And they'll come up afterwards and talk. And, and because I share family stories, they'll come up and ask, is it really true about your grandpa? And I'm like, yeah. I said, well, he'd be pretty proud of you. Yeah. And other people, you know, they'll say, is that true? And there are parts of my show that are fabricated to a degree. No and, way. And, yeah, of course. <laughs> who wouldn't? And I say to them, to be absolutely honest, it's kind of a fib. It's not a complete fib, but it's a fib. Uh, it's like I talk about my mother and my father, and I say, as young uh, boys, my brother and I used to peek through the curtain and watch as my father sawed my mum in half, stabbed her with swords, and floated in the air. You know, a pretty regular childhood. <laughs> and it gets a big laugh. And they say, did he really do that? I said, no, my dad didn't do big delusions. He did small magic tricks. And my mum didn't get floated or stabbed with swords until I was about 15 or 16. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth. I started putting her in boxes and stabbing her, which is an even better story. But it's told off stage and it becomes even more memorable for yeah. them because now they can share that story. When I first started, I had the character names of Farquhar and Felicity. There was no Sean, it was Farquhar and Felicity. Yeah. And that actually was a bad thing. I thought it was a good thing, but it was a bad thing. If I was working a casino circuit, maybe a great thing because, oh, that's Farquhar and Felicity. But as soon as I worked on chips, we had these people, they come over and they go, oh, hi to Felicity. Well, there was no Felicity. Lori, my wife, was Felicity. And so we would then have to explain the lie. It's not yeah. really a lie, but it is a lie to them. They go, well, her name really isn't Felicity, it's Lori. We just call it on stage. Why? Oh, it's a stage name. Why? Why? <laughs> they, they don't get it. We get it as performers. They didn't. Yeah. So then uh, later it became kind of a, a, a godsend because repeat passengers would come back. And they walk by and they go, oh, look, it's Farquhar and Felicity. And we go, hello, nice, welcome back. And then people go, look, it's Sean and Lori. And we go, oh, my Lord, we know them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it was a wonderful way to be able to siphon through repeat passengers the on the ones we met and the ones we hadn't. It's the same with me. If people know me outside of Magic, I'm Dave. Yeah. You know, if they know me through Magic, David. it's David. And so it's, a, it's great because I'm not changing my names. I'm, yeah. I'm, I, it's very the identifiable. familiarity of it. Yeah. It's a great way. You touched on something, and then I want to finish with one thought with names, then we'll move on. You mentioned that... You say something that then becomes another story off stage, and in PR training with Ringling Brothers and with some other companies as well, and all the PR stuff I've done, they they would basically what happened is there is always a certain amount of questions that you answer over and over, mm -hmm. and so what I started to do when I did the bird training show, they would ask certain questions. I would start to create stories around those questions, and I, I've since realized this is a very common public speaking thing, but to share it with the magic community and let them know that there are going to be those questions. Oh, do you ever saw your wife in half? Ha, ha, ha. And then have a story that if you're a funny guy, create a funny script for that. If you're serious, then create something that goes with that character. Your in your character. case, it's another chance to talk and, yeah. and share your personality with them and making you more memorable. And it totally makes you more memorable. Instead of it just being the moment of, oh, this is a question, it becomes a complete story that, yeah. that envelops it. And then they rem everybody remembers a story. Yeah. yeah, or at least parts of it. Yeah. Enough of it that, that was exciting. And then they embellish it. And, and then they embellish it. The fish was this big, <laughs> yeah. and it was great. And then his arm was lopped off, and he sewed it on with it. Yeah, because they've enjoyed the story, they want to make it just as strong and make it a little bit stronger, and it grows. I was on an elevator with two ladies just recently, and they were describing a magic show, and I said, I'm sorry, ladies, I just have to ask, where did you see this? And they went, well, on the ship. Didn't you go to the show last night? And I was like, Yes. And then I was like, thank you. And I got off because I was the show last <laughs> right. night and I didn't recognize what they were describing. Yeah. They yeah. already built it up so much more than what it was. But 
all the key moments were there and they didn't recognize me. I had a ball cap, I had sunglasses, I was in a pair of shorts heading off to Castaway Key on the beach to enjoy my day. Right. And I was like, wow, I think I missed something really great last night. <laughs> yes, you did. I'm like, that's... And, and they're defending you yeah. because they, if they have a personal vested interest in it uh, and uh, a great way uh, to make your magic more memorable is to actually talk to the audience and even more important, with the audience. Mm. Too often, people have scripts. They say what they're going to say. They know what they're going to I have never had a script in my life. I have bullet points. Now, I know that all the great ones will tell you have a script and work off the script, and I think that's great. I've got verbal diarrhea. I don't need the script. I know the bullet points, and I've done it so many times that I know how to get to it. But yeah. if the audience is uh, edgy, I can move faster. If the audience is tired, I can move even faster. If the audience is totally with me, I can slow down and make it a sweet... I think, in a sense, you do have a script. It's just not written out. Yeah, it's it's not... I've never written anything. Yeah. I built it over time. Yeah. And it's not in any specific order. They, they can switch in yeah. moments. Even the show, <laughs> which is the worst thing for a technical guy. <laughs> but there are moments in my show, there's a section... I have the opening and I have the closing, but that whole middle body, I have been known to call in a different order. And it was wonderful. I grew up doing it because I've worked my entire life with my wife. And Lori knew exactly where I was headed in the story. As I began to say something, she said, oh, he's doing that one next. And then we did it. And then she looked at me like, well, this is new tonight. Right. But she would alert the tech going, we're going to track five instead of three and four. Right. We'll probably come back to those right after. They Not go. everybody has that luxury. Exactly. Most don't. And, yeah. But I had that for years. Now that I don't, working solo most of the places I perform, I have to be a lot more conscious. More structured. Uh, and more structured, which I feel a little tethered by. And so I spend a lot more time talking with the audience. Mm -hmm. If I talk to the audience, it's, hey, how are you? And this is what I do. But if I actually stop, I, the perfect example is the Las Vegas performer goes, hey, where are you from? What have you done? That's nice. Let's move on. That's talking to an audience. When they say, where are you from? And they say, Boise, Idaho. No way. I've been to Boise, Idaho. I went to Bubble, and they go, you've been there. Uh, I have a moment in my show where I always say, you know, I come from, from a little place called uh, Maple Ridge in British Columbia, Canada, and about one out of every 30 shows, somebody, whoo hoo, and I, I stop, and it's like, you are not from Maple Ridge, British yeah, Columbia. Right. You know where it is, and they usually, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> we can move on. And then once I had a person that went, I am? I said, what street? And they said, River Road, which is my road, and I said, what's your address? And he said it, and I said, you live in the Blue House. And he's like, yes. I said, describe the house across the street. And he said, it's a kind of a pinkish colored house, a black roof, and he never mows his lawn. <laughs> and I went, I'm sorry, I'm out here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I met my neighbor. <laughs> but I, ju I just met my neighbor from when I was a kid. Our, he actually, their, their dog bit my brother, and <laughs> we never really knew them because our cul-de-sacs, like we were back neighbors, like our back fence lined up, and oh, we yeah. were just on my last cruise before I came out here. The more you work on ships, the more unusual people's stories you will have because yeah. the people come out of the woodworks that, I had a gentleman come up and he said, uh, did you live in New Westminster? And I said, yes. He says, uh, your place burned down. I said, yes. He says, you're a hero. So I'm sorry. He says, my friend's name is Ray. You pulled him out of a burning building. You're a hero. And I'm like, how is Ray? I never saw him after that night. And I never did. Yeah. I mean, that was 88. And this was maybe six years ago. And this guy, oh, Ray, he's got a business. He does this. He's great. And I'm like, so he's fine. And he's like, yeah. Said, well, yeah. that's pretty cool. Right. Like, what are the chances of ever seeing? But the more you work on ships, because it's such a wide demographic and from pretty much around the world on any, any week, there's something odd going on. It, it's... It's a different world. Yeah. And when you talk to them, instead of talking at them, when you talk with them, you will get those stories. And be prepared, because there'll be that person that just won't stop talking. Right. <laughs> I, I watched a performer who, who tried it, and he said, well, let, let's see who's out in the audience. And, and this girl just started talking. And he stood there and said, I don't remember giving you a speaking role in my show, because <laughs> he needed to bring it back. And they didn't bring him back, because he'd asked. Yeah. So he opened the door, mm. and then he slammed the door in their face, and he lost the whole audience who were now more interested in the young girl oh. and how she felt than him, the professional. And oh. I was like, 
Didn't handle that one really well. But he made if it you, memorable. Oh, he did. <laughs> Quite memorable. And the comment cards were probably really memorable. You, have you worked with a juggler named Dan Bennett? Oh, Dan Bennett. Yes, yes of course. So, I'm going, I know that name. Yes. So, so here's an example of, okay, we talked about Farquhar. We talked about David Da Vinci. We talked about names that are unique. Dan Bennett's a very generic name. Would yeah. you agree? Oh, definitely. Unless you say it right. In his show... <laughs> He says, he makes a joke about it. And I, I must have seen him in 03 on Princess when we were working together. And he says, Dan Bennett, you know, can you imagine what my parents thought of me? It sounds like somebody's swearing at me. The whole time I grew up, they were like, Dan Bennett? I still remember the name. I saw him one night. I ended up seeing him. We went on a cruise for vacation, which was retarded to do when you work on it for a living and spend 10 months a year. But we went on a cruise as a guest for real. And, wow, uh, I've never done that. Yeah, what right? What was that like? It was expensive. Awesome. Yeah, so we went out there, and, and, and this is the thing about being true to who you are on and off stage, mm -hmm. as well as, as find, first of all, find a way to make your name memorable. With him, he made fun of it sound like a curse word. So we see him on Royal Caribbean, and I say, hey, Dan, hey, I'm, I worked with you back on Princess. It would have probably been the Dawn or it would have been uh, Regal or whatever the ships were we worked. And, and I said, uh, I said, I, you know, I was a magician. I am a magician. I'm just on vacation. And all of a sudden, the verbal vomit that came out of his mouth and the negativity and how frustrated and depressed he was as an act and, oh. and how this is shit and this is shit. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. But, but this is, and I'm like, this is somebody who I admired. And he does, he does a great tennis ball and can juggling. He's, he's phenomenal. And he's in his professional environment. He's in his professional environment. And I made a paying guest. And, and I realized how powerful that was because I remembered him being hilarious mm. and approachable. Otherwise, I would have never gone up to him. So just to ring kind of two points, make your name memorable, but be memorable. And yeah. don't be the jerk off stage that, that he was in that environment. On and off stage, uh, Cruise World especially, you have to be basically on stage who you are off stage because if you're not they're going to see a huge difference and it's going to ring so badly for you and the negativity that will come with it and the comment yeah. cards and this works in the corporate world if it i did a a competition for magic uh, where uh it was a professional challenge i had six competitors and they were judged and uh when it was done uh, one act was brilliant and he thought he should win uh, but one of the judges gave him zero and the other judges all gave him tens. And he said, I want to speak to the other judge. I said, sure. Uh, I'm going to announce all the judges. So I announced the judges that were sitting in the front. And they said, and our lead technician is the final judge. And he goes, what? And I said, the lead technician mm. is a judge. He said, why? I said, because this is a professional competition. And you have to be professional both on stage and backstage as well as off stage. And so I wanted one judge who judged on how you dealt with the crew, how you did your take, uh, how you did all your technical rehearsal, uh, how you treated the other acts backstage. And he gave you a zero because you're a prick backstage. <laughs> yeah. You were bad to the crew. You were rude. You screamed at people. And, and, and as great as you are out there representing us as a magician, you're the exact opposite off stage, And so you're not good for our industry. If yeah. I were to give you an award, it would only hurt us all in the end. That's so important. And he was like, well, what do they count for? I said, and until Everything. you learn that lesson, <laughs> you will never know. Uh, that's one of the greatest things I find is that it, every time I phone into Disney's office, they say, we don't know what you do, but the crew love you. And, and I'm like, I don't do anything. I, I'm me. And yeah. I, I talk to them and I ask them how their life is. And are they lonely that they've been at sea for six months? And when do they go home? And what do they plan on doing? They're like, oh, they said, I'm not sure what the other acts do because I'm pretty sure they would do that too. It's called a conversation with a human being. But you know as well as I do. But a lot of them don't. They don't. A lot of them just see them as a tool to get to where they need to be. Uh, I, have, I have friends for life that were technical people and uh, the brothers before anything. And, and yeah. I just, I pride myself in that, that they, they, they know you, they'll remember you, and they're your best advertising because when you go to a venue, they're like, who do you have coming in? Oh, Sean Farquhar. Oh, well, then we're going to have a sweet show. And they're like, oh, the text like him. That's, that's... And you never know. You never know when you're going to see that person again. I worked with uh, a guy named Jason who was on the Norwegian Sun back in like 05 or something. And it was our first Norwegian gig. We, you know, everything was professional. We worked uh, under your guidance. So, <laughs> so awesome. I'm, I'm taking, you know, I bring my own spike tape. So if they Excellent. ask if I need spike tape, I, there's this funny story that I remember with you on this. And uh, anyway, so I do my show, and, and that was it. And, 
super nice guy. And so I, Copperfield calls me up. He says, David, I want you to come out to my islands and train me and my birds. And, and uh, so I'm like, okay, well, you need some birds. So we fly into Vegas, I meet David at the, at the warehouse. And in comes Jason. And he's like, Dave, what are you doing here? And I'm like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I'm working here. He's like, I work here. And he's one of one of David's main people. Awesome. And this is one of those texts that everybody else was pissing on. Yeah, but that you did. We hit it off. We did great. Yeah. And then his wife came out and was entertainment production manager for our show. And we hit it off great. And so it's you never know where those relationships are going to be and, and to, to really hold that professionalism with them. I was working in a shopping center. And this uh, uh, old man would come and watch the shows. You need more pigeons in the show. And the next day I put another dove in the show. You listen to me, I said. You come to all my shows. I put another pigeon in the show. <laughs> it's a Sunday. It's the largest mall in the world, uh, West Edmonton Mall, seventh wonder of the world, or eighth wonder, whatever they want to call it. I thought that was Greg Fruin. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so I'm there, and this old man is sleeping after my show on Sunday. And security's going to lock up the mall. I said, "Don't wake up, Papa. I'll go wake him up." And security said, "I wouldn't wake up, Papa. You know he owns the mall, right, Sean?" I said, "What? He's, yeah, he's the eighth richest man in Canada." <laughs> what? The old man is the eighth richest man. The whole mall is his shot. I'm like. Wow, I'm glad I put the pigeon in the show. <laughs> he opened a nightclub three months later, six and a half million dollars in lighting and sound, and guess who he hired to open the club and do magic on the dance floor? Me, and I stayed for six months. I That's gave me awesome. my own suite at the Argyle Plaza, and he said, I like people that listen. And I said, well, you're a nice man, I like you too, seeing how you pay me a paycheck every week. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great lesson. Yeah, the smallest person can really make a difference. So I'm on a cruise ship and I decide to bring 200 of my magician friends for a magic convention. And on the first night, I hire five of them to walk around and do a nightclub presentation, just strolling. And I said, I want you to visit with all my guests and I'll give you an incentive. In the room is a vice president of Microsoft <laughs> in charge of gaming. <laughs> yes. He loves magic. If you entertain him and he likes you, you're gonna have gigs for a long time. And off they all went to look for this guy. Now, Ed Freeze and I go way back. I, I uh, performed at his wedding for him and Kathy, and I done parties for him, and we're just good friends. Uh, we have poker parties together. And sometimes I charge him, sometimes I don't. He's just a good guy. <laughs> but Ed does not look like a vice president of Microsoft. He doesn't look like he would have much money. Yeah. Three houses on Lake Washington. Right. <laughs> as he's buying the property up on the whole side of the lake. So uh, three of the five don't even see Ed, one does something for him, and only one guy befriends him because he really looks out of place, the guy who has the holes in his jeans and the duct tape around his sneakers and, and does some magic for him, and then goes, oh, he likes puzzles, does some more stuff. At the end of the day, I said, hey, Ed, how was your evening? He said, only one guy showed me anything, but I really love him. Can we hire him for other things? And I was yes. like, that's awesome. So when I introduced him later in the cruise, everybody's like, how would you have ever guessed it was him? I said, you're not supposed to. You're just supposed to treat everybody the same. The saying, hey, there's a Microsoft guy, was a game for me. It was to make me see if you were willing to work for everybody or mm -hmm. if you'd immediately go for people who were rich looking and they were looking for shoes and watches. And, and I found that those guys that have the really expensive shoes and watches usually don't have a lot of money in their bank account because they've spent it on shoes and watches. Yeah. And uh, I, I treat everybody exactly the same. I treat them all with a level of respect and everybody deserves the same amount uh, unless you teach me otherwise, and that you're a jerk, I'm going to be as nice to you as possible. Yeah. Some of my millionaire mentors in, in different industries, uh, a good friend of mine, Greg Hare, he was on Fox's Secret Millionaire in 08, and a uh, multimillionaire and flies his helicopter. He's training me how to fly his helicopter. He comes over, he shoots his full automatic weapons on my property in Utah. We just, we just play. Yeah. You would never guess ever that he's a multimillionaire. Yeah. And you go over to his house, his, his house is, you know, obviously large, uh, but you know, he drives a, a Toyota. Yeah. He's got a Ferrari in there. It's covered with a blanket. doesn't take it out much. And it's got a, I think it's a Ferrari. It might be, no, yeah, it's a Ferrari. Because I remember him asking me to park it on the wedding night, and I out ground all the gears. I remember that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Another friend here in, in Vegas, he owns the, the Vegas um, racetrack, the, where you, you rent a Lamborghini, oh, yeah. a Ferrari, yeah. and he's out there wingsuiting. And he's, uh, I, I asked him, because I saw him fly in his, uh, he flew in in his helicopter, lands, and and I was jumping with him before I knew who he was, but I was following him on Instagram and then realized, holy crap, I just jumped with this guy. And long story short, I asked him a couple days ago, I was like, oh, did you fly in or drive? And he's like, oh, I drove. And so I look out in the parking lot, not a single nice car in this guy, you know, and yeah. he's, he's a very wealthy man. And so, so we're uh, actually giving a mixed message because we, we tell everybody here in the session, 
you know, dress for success, look unique, stand out, uh, and always look like you're going to a better place. And then we say these millionaires don't. But the difference is they were standing out. When they were going for where they were getting to, they did exactly what they needed to. And now that they're there, they're doing what they want to. In the book, uh, The Art of War, it's a fantastic book. And it talks about, in war, how to win. And it applies to business because it says, uh, in, in war, when you're weak, appear strong. Mm -hmm. When you're strong, strong appear, appear weak. weak. Absolutely. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Love that book, The Art of War. <laughs> uh, it's been translated like a thousand times. Right. <laughs> Seriously. But it still holds true. It does. And it's Absolutely. an old book. Yep. The, the richer you look, the, you can start to play poor. And when you're poor, you play rich. Uh, when I was young, I never wore blue jeans. I was always a pair of slacks. I wouldn't wear blue jeans. Now I wear blue <laughs> jeans all the time. Hey, I'm doing pretty good for myself at this moment in my life. Yeah. I've, uh, I have never felt more comfortable or more secure. I have contracts until 2018. Who has contracts till 2018? Wait, I do for the first time <laughs> in my life. This is not I'm like, normal. I'm Close almost, almost, almost. <laughs> just under, but nope. A few I'm, months under, but. Just under. Uh, I, I, when, when I have to have other people now working for me, I'm working, I'm consulting on a television series, I guess you call it television, for Hulu. Uh, they have a series coming out yeah. with, um, uh, uh, called the uh, Shut Eye from the guy from Burn Notice is in it. And I have uh, Alex, one of my young people I'm mentoring, and I'm teaching him the movie industry. And so he's basically doing everything. And I have to say to them, when you go in, Alex, you have to show an air of confidence because you are the magician. You are the only expert. He said, well, I really don't know about the movie. I said, you don't have to know about movies. Not hired That's not the what movie they guy. hired you yeah. for. They hired you to say, how does the magician do it? And I said, and when you go in, you have to dress so you kind of look like a magician. Well, what's a magician look like? You. <laughs> you. <laughs> think about what you portray and then think about it and go in and be that. And he goes, oh, okay. Next time he comes back, he says, that, that's a lot easier that way. Said, yeah. yeah. They stop and they listen because they don't have an idea. They have no idea about our industry. Uh, so you have to build yourself up and create that character that goes I'm in control. I know what I'm doing. Sometimes I'm not. I worked on the X-Files for five years. And I would go into and they go, well, this scene, we're going to have a gun. They spin the gun and the bullet disappears. I'm like, <clears throat> can you explain <laughs> how I opened the barrel of the gun? Because this isn't like the toy I had when I was young. Right. Well, Sean, this is a Magnum 44. But I'm like, oh, awesome. You're like, this, I'm Canadian. <laughs> this is a lot heavier than the toy guns I had when I was a kid. And then they explain, I'm like, all right, let's make this work. As a magician, this is what, and soon as I say as a magician, I have the confidence to go back in and say, this is what I would do, this yeah. is how I change it, I would grind this down, I would change that, and is that okay with you as far as the gunsmith goes? Certainly. Awesome. Then we're on the same page. Let's yeah. go make a movie. And, and it works out. Very cool. Yeah. What else do you suggest to, to people, and maybe we break it down by industry. Uh, a lot of people watch this for kid show performers. A lot of people are wanting to be maybe a corporate performer, or maybe they're in the corporate industry, but somebody else who's branded better is, is doing better. How, how would you advise these people through being more memorable to, to grow their business? Here's a great piece of advice that actually works for the two of them. Having been a children's magician for years and years, I think I won the children's magician of the year in British Columbia like four or five times, and being a corporate magician and still doing corporate magic, I made a big mistake when I was young. I kept my name, just Sean Farquhar, as a kid's magician, and then tried to go into the corporate market and into the comedy market. And I had to mm. drop markets because I was just one name. If I were a family entertainer starting again, I would be a unique name. I would make up a name. And it would be something that I could sell later when all the goodwill that goes with it when I decided to leave one or the other. Because maybe your corporate does better than your family, or maybe your family does better than your corporate. I was doing $60,000 a year as a kid's show magician back in the days when you charge $150 for a kid's birthday party. But I did five on a Saturday and three on a Sunday and every day of the week I had one after school. And I, this was me in high school. Yeah. My teachers hated me for it. <laughs> it's like I can't blame them. But My teachers would say to me, you know, Sean, you need to concentrate more on school. And I said, I don't want to be rude, but you know, I make more doing kids' birthday parties than your salary as a school teacher. While you're teaching me, I go out on the weekend and make more money than you. And they're like, yeah, but that's not going to last forever. Hello, still here. Just like they said, you need to do math because there, it's not like you're going to have a calculator, calculator in your, your pocket every time. Like, I'm pretty sure I, I don't even know math. what the functions are. Half <laughs> on the calculator I've got. So if I were starting again, or I had an opportunity to start even in the middle, 
I would develop a unique character for my corporate and a unique character for my children. I would separate mm. them family. I would have them completely divided and nothing in common from each other so that they don't see one goes into the other. Why? Because I can build them both up uniquely and at the same time I can sell one to another. If I do a nice big corporate fair and they go, you know what, we have a kid's birthday, uh, kid's Christmas party coming, I got the guy for you. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and now you've got this guy. If you're doing that and they're going, you know, you're really fun with the kids. Do you know anybody in the industry that would be, you know, for, more for an adult one? I got the guy for you. <laughs> and they can see. And when they see you and they go, well, it's the same guy. But you do a completely different style, totally character driven, completely different. You're going to win them over. And you're going to have That's two great. different markets. As opposed to me, I was doing a $150 children's birthday party and going out at night and saying, I'd like $1,500 for an evening corporate show. And they said, you're 45 minutes <laughs> right. at my house and you're 30 minutes on the pipe and drape stage, how can that, and then I go and do a comedy club on a Saturday night, drop the F-bomb twice, and I'm like, what kind of kid's entertainer drops an F-bomb? Yeah. And it made my market all over the place. Yeah, memorable, but in the wrong way. Yeah. And so if I were starting again, I would change that. And then I would define my market. Uh, if I'm going after corporate, corporate, you really want to look at who else is in your market. I've never been that guy who phoned up and pretended to be a client. I've always looked at everybody else not as competition. I don't think there is competition. Uh, so many people have said that in these presentations. The, the, the Hulu people said to me, can you recommend a backup who's comparable to you? And I said, I don't want to sound arrogant, but no. I said, why? I said, <laughs> you asked comparable. If you ask me who is suitable, I can get you somebody, but I can't compare myself to anybody else. Why? I said, because I'm me. And yeah. my unique skill sets are unlike anybody else's. Yeah, they may know this part, but they don't know that part. They may have, in, look, we both know how to, how to do shrouded transition, but uh, I don't know how to strip field uh, an AR-15. Right. But on the other hand, you probably don't know how to sharpen uh, a buck, well, you probably don't know how to sharpen a buck. I, knife. I you, do live in Idaho. <laughs> that's true. You probably don't know how to uh, um, value the mint of a coin. No. Right? Yeah. Okay, so neither do I. Um, <laughs> Okay. And it's field strip, not strip field. It's, exactly. <laughs> See, well, there you go. You would know how to say the question correctly. Okay. But because of that, we all have some knowledge in common yeah. in our field of magic. But we go in different directions because of other things. I, I don't know how to change a carburetor. Uh, I don't you care. You don't need to. Absolutely. I don't need to. I've made enough that somebody else can do You're it for outsourced. me. <laughs> so wonderful. Because I remember having to do it when I was young. I tried it on my VW Beetle and oh, I failed. It's insane. They sent me the wrong carburetor, which is partly. Oh, even better. But I didn't know. I, I tried to change the starter in a uh, uh, Opal Cadet, which is a really cool little car. It's like a mini uh, Corvette if you can't afford a Corvette. Uh, and the yes. uh, problem is you have to actually remove the brake line. And uh, then you have to bleed the brake line, then you have to redo the brake line. And I got halfway through and couldn't do it, so I phoned the uh, AAA. And the guy came up and said, well, you made a real mess of this. <laughs> yes, I did. I need you to tow me some places. This is like a foreign car. There's no places around oh. here. I said, that's awesome. Thanks for coming out. He says, I'll stay with you, and we'll work on it together. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. That's like me trying to get the battery out of my, my first my Chevy Blazer. I electrocuted myself because I took the wrench, and I touched both pieces <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so, like, I'm not a car guy. I'll do car tricks. So, so finding who's in your market, finding out why they're in the market. I had a person just recently phoned me in my area, which isn't really my market. My market is the world now. But I had a person in my area phone and say, hey, I'm losing work. I've been the guy for a long time, and now I'm not. Why? And I said, well, who are you losing it to? He says, well, X and Y. And I said, why do you think? And he says, I'm not sure. I said, well, uh, send me a recent promo video of what you have. He says, I, I don't have a re recent promo video. I said, so you're not keeping current. Why? He says, well, I'm working lots. I said, and now you're not going to work lots because you haven't kept current. My grandfather had the best analogy I've ever had, and it's the secret to success explained from a farm. So when you get on the farm, you know that little pump for the water? You know the one where you pump it? Yeah. Have you ever pumped it? Nothing comes out when you pump it, right? You pump about eight or ten times, yeah, yeah. and then a little bit of water comes out. And then you pump a little bit more, and it primes the pump, and then the water flows out, and you get your big bucket of water. Yeah. And then you leave it. And then what happens? You, you pump get again, the momentum again, and you get that going. And then, and the secret of success is, don't do that. Instead, <laughs> start pumping it. And once the water starts, take a sip, pump a little bit, take another sip and pump a little bit and take a sip. Because as soon as you just sit there and drink the water for a long time, you're gonna end up at the bottom starting all over again. And the secret is momentum. Yeah. You always, success breeds success. 
Once you get one thing going, more things go. When you look busy, you are busy. When you're not busy, God knows you'll be unbusy for a very long time. Yeah. If you find a way to be busy, you'll see that other people see you're busy and they'll hire you. It yeah. really works that way. Same thing, if you're not working, you're gonna stay not working. Get out there, find a job. I, I worked in the restaurants. I used to just walk into the restaurant and say, you have a huge lineup outside and the, the wait for your food is 25 minutes. I can make that vanish down to feel like five minutes. What? I said, let me explain. I would never do it at that time. I would do it after. I'd sit and eat my meal and then talk to the manager when he was cooling down after his busy rush. I said, I bet you lost 12 or 13 people who walked away because they couldn't be seated and they just needed to go someplace. But if they'd been entertained, they probably would have waited. How? Let me show you. And I won them over. Yeah. Uh, Expo 86 was the first to do, I think, lineup maintenance. They hired entertainers just to stand in front of the exhibits where the lineups were and entertain people. Mm. And, and, and It's brilliant. Nightclubs do it now. Everybody does it. It's uh, trade shows. Have people lined up to go in to see the displays or in to see a movie. They have a performer who basically is there to keep them so that they'll wait in line to go in and see something. Prizes is not the way to do it. Yeah. You know, oh, I'll give you something. I have all these guys say, oh, I offer them something, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that, that doesn't work. Once in a while, I told one student a long time ago, he wanted to work on cruise ships. I said, uh, send this agent a VC, VCR, VHS type tape. Don't send a DVD. DVDs are just coming in. Because if you send a DVD, she's just going to throw it out. She you told me that advice a long time ago. <laughs> she doesn't own it. And so they, people always sent them, and they always got booked. And then this one guy said, I got booked and I sent a DVD. I said, how? I said, I sent her a DVD player. <laughs> said, really good. He says, she hired me because I bought her a DVD player. Yeah. And he kept working. That's funny. Yeah, still working. In fact, he books me now. Yes. <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> My student's booking me. That's very good. I love it. I do too. It's a nice legacy. Yeah. Um, if I'm a corporate person, I'm going to look at what the other corporate people are doing and I'm going to do it differently. I don't want to be like everybody else. Uh, everybody else has a business card. I don't own a business card. I haven't had a business card. In you explained years. this to me, but with the next two minutes or so that we have left on this, this cut, uh, what can you explain to everybody else so they understand that? Sure. Very simple. I was on a cruise ship, and a man said to me, "I want to book you for a show." And do you have a business card? I said, I don't. He said, how could you not? I said, I, I lost my business cards. Uh, I ran out of them handing them out to people. And he goes, oh. And he took a business card out, turned it around. He said, these are the dates. This is where it is. Here's where I had last year. And this is sort of the budget range. Is that good for you? And I said, I'll call you in a couple days after you get home from your vacation, and we'll solidify this. And I did. Locked it in great. It was so amazing. And then I went, that's kind of weird. There was no game played. Normally, I hand you the business card, and you leave as the client, and you leave and you forget it and it never and I have nothing that's not good instead I had his card and I called him that's pretty good a week went by two guys from New Orleans came on board we're having this big fair festival blah 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 would you interest I said yeah and instead I said I don't have a business card haven't had one for quite some time I don't really need them I'm working a lot but do you have a business card sure because they do took it away said what's the dates you're looking at what kind of budget do you have who have you had in the past Look, you guys are on vacation. In three or four days when you get home, I'll call you and we'll set this up. And then I keep all those business cards. And I bought one of those old 1980 Rolodexes and I have this little punch that punches the bottom of them and I put them into my Rolodex. I don't put them in by alphabetical order. I put them in by the months in which their events take place. And I call it my wheel of fortune. <laughs> and when I have no work six months from now, I'll wheel it forward to six months and I'll call those people. Because even though I've already worked for a lot of them, I can work for them again. Because once I've tasted blood, I can go back again and again and again. <laughs> and they can never stop me because I have their phone number. Yes. <laughs> I have the ball. If I give you the ball and say, call me, I just have to wait. But if I keep the ball, I can call you until you book me. And a lot of people, too, in fact, I can name very clearly, both book me hoping I'd stop calling. But once they book me, then it was like, hey, it worked. <laughs> Let's keep calling. I have a database of guaranteed clientele. Plain and simple. That's a great advice. <laughs> great advice. I love it. Well, let's talk a little about music and how you use music to make your magic more memorable. You're, you're very well known for your card trick to music. Yeah, and, uh, shaped I'll, my heart, but it's only one. I have another one to music or card trick. I heard about it. I heard yeah. about it through people on ships. That's, because everybody knows each other. Yeah, but uh, very few people have seen it unless you're actually on a Disney ship. I don't do it anywhere else but on Disney, but uh, people have... They, they share it, tell, and uh, 
Uh, it's called Unwritten. It's uh, a beautiful piece of magic. I, I think it's stronger. Uh, mm. it, it has not, uh, knock on wood, uh, to date, uh, it has not uh, failed uh, me. I've got a standing ovation each and every time I performed it. Mm. And people, I, I look, if I see a magician in the crowd or I feel this magician in the crowd, I don't perform it. Really? Uh, yep, I really want it to be just this intimate. And I come right to a table uh, out into the audience and uh, the camera comes and the lighting comes and I do it right at the couple's table. And uh, cool. it could easily be a wedding song. In fact, I think it was a wedding song for a lot of people. Uh, unwritten has the whole thing. The rest is still unwritten. The book is still unwritten. And, and it's just so strong. And, and it goes exactly against everything that uh, we're taught. Always pick music that's a little innocuous, always with big high beats and strong. Always pick music without lyrics. And, and the stuff that I love the most are like uh, Sting, uh, Etta James, and At Last for my rope routine. Uh, all of the music that is in my show is exactly wrong according to what's right. Yes. Um, but because it's wrong, it really plays well. Uh, even, even when you go to get a volunteer, 90% of people have you know, that nice innocuous music. And, and I pick Beatles, help, I need somebody, help, not just anybody, help. And the crowd goes crazy. because Part of that's knowing your character and yeah, what works with you, right? it totally is. Uh, like Copperfield played the thong song. Yeah. But it works for him. It totally does. <laughs> it doesn't Absolutely. work for everybody. No. Um, but <laughs> but is that kind of a character? It's totally yeah. finding um, music that speaks to your heart first and then finding some magic that works with it. Uh, how many people have done uh, Miser's Dream to Pink Floyd's Money? I mean, yeah, that just speaks to itself. But I saw a magician, John Kaplan, who's a, a great marketing magician that does fundraising in Canada. Uh, he did a hand chopper with Kevin James's disembodied hand. And uh, he put a red hand onto the girl, uh, like a glove onto her, put it through the little hand chopper, and it was one of those French choppers where the hand drops down. <laughs> and then he reached in and he pulled it out, and that very moment the music came out and said, I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. <laughs> and I was Brilliant. like, that's really great. It's just it, finding those moments where lyrics really make a difference. Uh, you can make your magic so much more memorable when you add music to it, even the innocuous stuff, because uh, we all know when you hear Vivaldi's Four Seasons, you think Lance Burton. We, yeah. There are songs that will always be certain people's magic. It just happens because yeah. the, it evokes emotion. If you pick one that already has something emotionally attached to it, you lose. If, it, if it's something like, you know, if I picked uh, The Candle Burns Out Long Before, the, the, everybody's thinking Diana, it's already got a connection. The uh, mm -hmm. Lion King already has a connection to something. Find a piece of music that doesn't have a connection to it. But that touches you. That touches you, and now you make that connection. They'll see the connection between you and the music, and then they will feel it. Uh, that's so important. It's first dance at any wedding. Uh, the bride always picks something that's special to her. She hopes it's special to the groom. The groom goes, yeah, I'll dance to that. <laughs> and then when they start to the dance, the audience sees the bride totally enamored. The groom is so touched that she's crying. They're having the beautiful it has nothing dance. to do with the groom, just it's, the music. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Our, and it, our first song was She's Only 17 because awesome. we got married young. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> uh, I have a friend who got married to another one, Bites the Dust. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Third marriage? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We, so second, but yeah. That was one of the things with, with Jamie and I. You've seen my levitation. You booked me for my yeah. levitation. And that was something. I heard the music on Gone in 60 Seconds, and it was in this moment where they're screwing in a Lamborghini, watching another couple screw in a window. Yeah. And I thought, that's really romantic. <laughs> and so, but the, I love your value of romance. It's very nice. <laughs> and so it's I, actually a great scene, by the way. It's, 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 a, it's a powerful yeah. scene. And it was one of my favorite movies at the time, and, and I always liked Lamborghinis. Um, although I'd rather have a Hummer, but... Mm. Uh -huh. uh, sorry. <laughs> there was a sexual reference there, there wasn't was. there? No, Without uh, you I'd rather have an H1. But... Yes. Uh, well, now that I'm thinking about it, <laughs> I digress. So <laughs> yeah, I heard this song there, and I remember it, it touched me in, that, in, that, in the movie, but about the soundtrack, and I would always find myself coming back to that song. And this is before I realized how powerful music would be in a magic routine. And so Jamie and I took our first four-month contract on the Dawn Princess, and we every month we didn't spend any money on Princess because they pay for everything. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, so <laughs> <Like some laughs> fast forward to today. Uh, so we, we put all, I mean, literally, all, all, like we'd spend maybe 10 bucks a, a week and the rest just went into a savings account and to Tim Clothier, who then built uh, our levitation. And on the ship every week, we would design this levitation around the song because the song I could picture, I could picture all of it. And I could, I wrote the routine to the music and that's one of the most powerful pieces yeah. that I have in my show. And now there's been a few other pieces like that. It's because it was personally connected to you even before the effect. And yeah. that you built an effect off of that personal connection changes it completely. Audiences, they feel it. They do. Uh, even in, in acting, you watch a movie and you can tell when the actor is pale or doesn't believe the character. Uh, I watched a movie just recently, The Notebook, and I said to my wife, because it was one of those, I said, those two actors hate each other. She said, no, they don't. They're truly in love. I said, I'll bet if you go and you I read, Google it. they hate each other. And it turns out that Ryan Reynolds absolutely despised her, and she despised him, and they, he tried to have her replaced in the film. And I said, as much as they were acting and showing, I could just totally feel there was this something that was wrong in it. There's, and that, that ties in, too, to just your own show. You know, like, sadly, I've seen some acts recently that their their heart's not in it and you feel it and it's almost a there's there's a disconnect for sure and it shows after the show yeah. people don't want to go see that entertainer mm -hmm. and it it sucks because that's a representation to the community yeah. for entertainment in general forget if just, it's a magic a yeah. juggler a comedian a just a live entertainment just a live entertainment it's it's and I hope if this person's watching it, they don't take it personal. And that's why I'm not mentioning their name and any other details. But the the disconnect is there. And it, it kills me because it has so much potential if the stories were real. A lot of the stories just felt like, blah, 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 this is my script. And I didn't actually write a script, no offense. And yep. it's, and, and it didn't it didn't work for this performer. And after the show, a lot of people just walked on by. And yeah. it was really sad. And it was almost like, the passion wasn't there. And I have, it I have, have a person. Uh, I, I wrote a column for a long time in the IBM's magazine, uh, Lincoln Hearing, called uh, Approachable. And basically, young people wrote me, asked me questions, and then I didn't answer all of them myself. I went and found people to answer them. And one of the greatest was, uh, uh, "Do you get nervous before a show?" And I wrote, "Yeah, every show." And I think anybody who doesn't is doing a disservice to the audience. I don't mean nervous that you'd feel incompetent or unable to perform. But you should feel a certain level of, are they going to love me? Is this going to register? Are, am I going to connect tonight? Is yeah. this going to be a weird audience? And, and, and um, I can't think of the uh, uh, psychologist's name, uh, but he said, uh, it's okay to have butterflies in your stomach. Just teach them to fly in formation. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, right? Yeah. Because I, I hear every once in a while, a performer going to say, I never get nervous. I, I, I stopped being nervous years ago. And then I see their show and I'm like, yeah, I can see why. Because you gave up. You phoned in that show. Mm -hmm. You aren't even on that stage anymore. That performance is what you did 12 years ago when you gave up. <laughs> and that's what you're doing now because it pays a paycheck. Yeah. And, and, and it hurts me and everybody else here when you go out there because nobody wants to come back into the theater and see your lie because you're just doing that. And, and it, it's hard to watch. And I, I said to one performer, I said, I know why you're not nervous, because you gave up caring. Yeah. Uh, if I ever went out there, I have a couple of times. I mean, I've flown 30, 36 hours, arrived, and been told, you know, hey, we've scheduled you for tonight. I'm like, really? Because the other four entertainers who haven't worked can't do tonight? Oh, well, no, but we've already advertised you, and we didn't realize it was 38 hours. And so if you could shave and go out there, I'm like, sure. And you go out there, and you already have a built-up anger in you, yeah. and, and you just you you just you like, and now you try to let that go, and then you put on that oh, I'm going to be great, but you don't feel it, and yeah. and you do the show, and I can look, I, I videotape everything I do, and mm -hmm. and I watch the show, and I'm like, you should be embarrassed that you 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 couldn't for some reason shake that off and find yourself. And I'm like, it's hard. There's days. There's yeah. you know, everything there's was piled on top of you, yeah. and then there you're trying to dig your way out. And I almost got my head above, but I didn't. Yeah. And and and, and I should find it because I had one where uh, I did a television show, and uh, the the director said that they were going to. Uh, not have a camera close, that it had to be a distance. I said, it's impossible for me to present it without being able to see the camera to know where the lens is, so I'm following it, so you need to do it. All right, so they brought the camera in, they opened the curtains, live live show, and as soon as the curtains opened and I was on stage, then they moved the camera back to where the director wanted it. 
And so he played his little game and, and my hands shook because I was angry. Yeah. I was, I was literally, I had rage and I was like, people said, you looked a little nervous. It had nothing to do with nerves. <laughs> I, adrenaline was pumping through me and all I wanted to do was slam somebody's head against the wall because I had no idea where the camera was and where I was presenting to and it was like performing blind. Yeah. Just, yeah. But like you say, if you don't uh, commit and want to do it and, uh, and believe in what it is and you leave your baggage at home, it's not going to be a good show. Yeah. And you really, I think it's important to be a little anxious. I like it. Uh, it's, it's an adrenaline rush. Just before the show, 30 seconds before, when I'm like, just clear my throat before I know the mic's going to go live, I go, I hope this goes well. Right. And you walk out and the audience goes, how do you go, oh, this is going to be good. Yeah. Three minutes into it, I've done my first routine, and you kind of take that breath, and you start to talk to the audience, and you just go, I love being here. I, I, it's the most comfortable place I've ever been in my life is standing on a stage. That's one reason I put my Dove Act back in. I got so bored at the show because the, the jokes, the lines, everything was predictable because, it, I've, as you know, you do it so many times, it's only going to be one of two or three different ways and yeah. it's going to be almost the same every time and there's slight variables and those are fun and those are welcome. You have some loud guy from Boston screaming out, mm -hmm. you take that moment and you milk it, but oh. that only happens once every couple yeah. of months, even if you're selling out of there every Friday for two years. But, yes. <laughs> but then I put the Dove Act back in and I'm like, holy crap, I'm nervous. This is six minutes with about 42 different times I could screw up. Exactly. You know? And it's thrilling for you. Those are the nerves that are, that are good and, and I... I hate to beat that. I've said, I mentioned a couple times on the presentations. I'm in Vegas getting trained for skydiving, and part of what I'm what I'm being trained to do is visualize every aspect of the jump before I do the jump. And uh, there were a couple times we did four jumps in one day. They were turning planes. I would just grab a new uh, new rig and I'd throw it on as we're going into the plane. The guys debriefing me, and these are like you know my 14th and yeah. 15th jumps ever. And so I'm going up to 12,000 feet, and I'm I'm trying to picture it. And the ones where he he kept like, oh, don't forget we're gonna do this, and don't forget to do this. I was screwing things up. And you don't want to be screwing things up at 12,000 feet. No. And I noticed the same parallel. 12,000 to 1,000 comes real quick. It does. Yeah. <laughs> Approximately 44 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> but I was finding a, a, a really close parallel in that because I found in the show the nerves that I experienced when the door opens and you feel 140 mile an hour wind sitting you, that's the same nerves, the same feeling that I feel before I go on stage. Just before you step up. But you tunnel it, you channel it into this is what I do. You picture it, you visualize it, you know what you're going to do, and you use that energy instead of turning it into fear and paralyzation or anger, yeah. and you really channel it into the character and like, I'm yeah. getting goosebumps thinking about sure. it because I can picture that the joy moment. that's going to come with it's it. It's the same thing. Yeah. Like I'm feeling, I'm talking about Scott, I'm feeling the same thing that I feel on stage. It's always me in the tech stage left, and, and for a while it was Dennis, and we'd always, we'd make fun of my announcements, like he's performed on five continents, and I'm like, He's never left his house. He's performed yeah. for 25 cents in his parents' basement. And yeah. I'm saying this to like kind of ease my nerves, but I visualize everything and, and then I go out and that energy's there. But the, those nerves need to be there. And if they aren't, my show flatlines. It's flat. I, I, I ask the techs backstage all the time. I said, am I the only guy that's this talkative? <laughs> They're like, are you talking because you're nervous? Oh, yeah. They're like, then you're not. I'm like, that's good. It's like, Here we go. Let's have some fun. Because every one of mine's a one-nighter. Um, 90% because I fly on and off of ships. Uh, that tech is going to actually come on stage four times, bring props and drop props while I'm out in the audience getting people, and I'm going to turn around and discover if they put the right prop on the stage in the correct position, and I'm only going to discover it then, and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. And they're just as nervous as I am. And so yeah. I bring them down by going, you know what? Watch the first five minutes of the show, and you'll see that my character is such, if you put the wrong thing out, it'll be golden. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Do it right, because I don't need to test me. But if it happens, know that I will look after it. And they're like, oh, that's a good thing On to On that know. same character, too, because my character is not that way. And so to give two different examples of the, uh, the two sides of the same yeah. coin, I will walk through the important things. I've had people bring out ring and gumball backwards. Uh, that nice. kind of exposes yeah. everything. It kind of screws up. Hey, look, there's a hole. Right. Uh. <laughs> Deja vu. <Yeah>. <laughs> And so I, the important things, I make sure that they put out there and we'll just, we'll walk through it. And sure. it can take five minutes. And I've found, because my character and the way the show is, it has to go fast. And granted, I'm there for longer periods of time, so it's a little bit different. But 
I go through those important things and I make sure that they don't feel that I'm nervous. Yeah. Because then they will be nervous. Yeah, then they get a little anticipate, oh no, we're gonna screw up. I, I, I really wanna calm them down more and then tell them I'm excited and that's why I have nerves. Yeah. My nerves are, I wanna go out and have fun. Yeah. We're gonna go play now. And I never say I'm gonna do a performance. When I'm backstage, it's, it's my turn to play yet. Is it time, is it time? Yeah. No, the cruise director goes out first, but I'm next, right? They're like, yeah, Sean, awesome, let's go play. And those are the stories that make those people Talk about you. You know, I mean, we're we're an industry where other magicians are coming and going to our same spot. We're not the first magician that these people worked yeah. with, and uh, and there's that arrogance with it. They expect from a, from magic, and if you can come in and be a Sean Farquhar and be just humble and and vulnerable, as as we've talked about in several seminars about just being approachable and vulnerable and being you and being real and authentic, it plays not only to the audience but. As you mentioned, yeah, the, the backstage text makes a huge difference. Huge. And the text can make the difference on your show. I watched a comic who uh, uh, verbally attacked the, uh, the text. He kept grabbing the antenna of his microphone, going uh, $30 million in the theater and Radio Shack microphone. And they just turned it off. <laughs> and then the god mic came on from the booth going, if you didn't hold it by the antenna, it would probably work correctly. <laughs> Biggest laugh on the comic show. <laughs> and he, he raises his head up to the top and says, I wish I'd written that. And the crowd went crazy again. <laughs> he won them back. He's a professional, but what an idiot to, to not know how to hold the microphone. But you know what? And even a bigger idiot to attack the, the technical staff. That, that may be written into his show now. Yeah. If he was smart, he would. Yeah. I somehow don't think he was that smart. <laughs> and I, I haven't seen him back on the ship, so I'm pretty sure he's done. Probably not. Uh, I, I've taken the blame for things. I had a technician just recently. Um, the, the Matrix went down, and they weren't able to show the camera it just showed the front of the ship on this giant big screen and i said well apparently <laughs> the crew pool <laughs> and i said apparently i did something wrong ladies and gentlemen and i don't know how i've done it but uh, i'm going to ask if the text can fix it for a moment and while they do uh, let me grab a little person of the audience and we'll try something and i brought a little kid up and i did one of my i extra thought you were going to say you brought up a midget that would have been great oh that would have been perfect no i brought up a little kid did a little routine and then i looked and i saw the technician going that with his thumb and i was like I think they fixed my, uh, my mistake. Let's get going. And then did it. afterwards, the technician said, you did nothing wrong. Why did you say that? I said, why can't I take the blame? They like mm -hmm. me. I said, if I said the technician did it, they're not going to like you. They don't know you, but they like me. So I can use a little bit of that love to save both of us. And he's like, yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, so we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about all different ways that people can really make themselves memorable, their legacy when they leave the theater memorable. But let's talk a little bit more about their branding. And if there's somebody who is, and I know there's a lot of guys out there, and, and some of my good friends are in this situation, they may have a, a pretty generic look, they may have a pretty generic show, they might buy a lot of material, um, but they're not working a lot, and their website is maybe good, maybe bad, but it'll say walk around magic, corporate, birthday parties, school shows, uh, and like we talked about earlier, you know, you might be doing twenty dollars an hour at Red Robin, or then you know, how are you going to get fifteen hundred or fifteen thousand for that corporate gig? What advice can you give? Because I know there's a, probably a lot of people that fit that demographic. They have the the balloon vest or the the magic wand vest and the just the generic feel. How could somebody take action? And this is normally my end question. We'll maybe do another version of that later. But how could somebody take action right now? who fits that mold, if they're listening to this and they're thinking, yeah, that, that kind of maybe describes me, or maybe they don't want to hear that, but in the back of their mind, they're thinking, yeah, maybe that is me. That's the first thing <sighs> you have to How do we direct do. that? They have to look in the mirror and realize they are that person, because I think that a lot of them are probably listening and watching this, but don't think it's them. Can you reword it in your words? Because people hear and understand things differently depending on who's saying them. Yeah, when you look in, when you look in the mirror, you have to look and decide, am I being me? Or am I just being a shadow of who I am? And you have to look and go, am I that guy that's a parody of the magic? Am I just doing the tricks the way the instructions say them? Or am I adding something, contributing something to it? If, you, if you look and see, okay, I am that guy in the balloon vest who does hippity hop rabbit exactly as it was written in the instructions, and the kids do laugh, but I'm nothing special. Well, and you can recognize that, then there's lots of things you can do to change it. First, as long have, as they recognize it. As long as you recognize yeah. it. If you recognize you don't have a good website, get a better website. You don't How? have to do them yourself. Uh, there, there are tons of programmers out there. Uh, go to Fiverr.com. Uh, go to, um, uh, there's this uh, Freelancer.com. There are hundreds of places. Or learn to do WordPress. WordPress is a very simple thing. Wix, there's a dozen different websites that are almost free 
Yeah. It'll allow you to do it. A, a domain name is almost Four, nothing 1495. now. 1495. 1495 with is a top end. <laughs> I'm telling you. With unlimited data and email accounts, don't have one website. Have ones for each thing you're going to do. Don't shotgun. That, that, that the worst thing in the world is when you had a business card that says bar mitzvahs, weddings, corporate events, cruise ships, nightclubs, and casinos. Really? You've been to all of them? Because you certainly aren't working them if it's all written on your business card. Yeah. Pick a, pick a subject and attack it. Go after it. Win it and then move to another market. If you want to be a kid's entertainer, be the best kid's entertainer. Market everything around it. Change your look. If, if, you, look, if you look like you've got a, a goofy mustache or you, you have a bald spot, either build on it, change it, or, or, or grab it to one or the other. Make it yours. Mm. Accept it and make it yours. Then, then promote the crap out of it. Uh, get the best, if you're gonna use a business card, get the best business card. If you're gonna use a flyer, get the best flyer. Don't do marketing the way everybody else does it. When I did kids' birthday parties, I went to the bakeries and I, I brought in these little cardboard top hats that I made that said, win a free magic show. If you buy a cake here, your ticket goes in, one of you will win a free magic show. And I gave one magic show a month, but I also collected 35 kids who had birthdays in that month in that that were month? coming up that they were ordering. And I phoned them all and said, I'm sorry, mom, you didn't win the magic show, but I'll give you 40% off because you entered the contest and you bought a cake from that place. And they went, oh, okay. Okay, one person did win. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was good. It's morally <laughs> obligated to do it. And I went and did theirs. But I handed out coloring sheets to every one of the parents that came. I printed the cheap. I had very expensive business cards when I first started doing children's birthday parties. Nice photo color ones. Everybody thought that was great. But I looked expensive, so a lot of parents never called. So then mm. I produ produced the cheapest business card, and I gave them clumps, not one. I could afford to give 30 to the mother <laughs> at the end. When she wrote me the little checker, gave me my little cash in my hand, I said, oh, and here's a business card. And I handed her about 30. What is she doing with them? She's dropping them in every goodie bag or handing them to every parent as they came because she didn't want them in her house. So it was great advertising for me. Yeah. And I looked inexpensive enough for them to call. And once they called, I was inexpensive. But then if they wanted something extra, then I upselled them on all the parts until it became something expensive. So take any market you're gonna go after and embrace it. Only concentrate on it. Nobody is great at everything. There are no experts at everything. There are only experts in individual fields. So look at what it is. Find out what other people, watch what the other people in the field are doing. Do what they do, but do it your way. Don't do it as everybody else does it. Uh, find a niche. Find something that makes it a little bit different. Uh, I had a friend, uh, he was just a ventriloquist. And so, just a ventriloquist is just a ventriloquist. But if you're Gary Gumboot, you're totally different because just the name says you're different, right? I want to point out Chance Wolf here, too. You Chance, know, Chance is a great example of somebody who took Hippity Hop Rabbits, branded it with Wolf's Magic, and, and he revolutionized it by adapting something else. And Dan Sperry and I talked about this, too, not to go too off topic, but, but he took some other outside interest, you know, like Dan's interest are gothic and that kind of yeah. thing. And uh, in Chance's interest is that he's a award-winning artist that drew for Spawn Comics Animator. and, and yeah. has... Uh, Grammys or Emmys or Oscars yeah. or whatever. <laughs> he's got some big awards on his wall. He's, he's, he's amazing. And now yeah. he's revolutionizing ventriloquist puppets. So everything he's he doing does is different. has his touch to it yeah. because he doesn't do it like everybody else sees it. And, and it's easy to do. You just find what you like and infuse it into it. And it can be as, as simple as uh, the goofiness that you put into it. Uh, I know we all look and go, that's funny, that guy did it, it'll be funny for me. And yes, it will, but it'll only be as funny, if a little less funny, than what the original guy did. Make it your own, uh, and then it becomes yours. Uh, so now you're looking at your costume. Do you blend in? Uh, I see all the children's entertainers now have all gone towards a pair of shorts and, and uh, up the, the, the sports bowling shirt. Uh, but they all have it now. Mm -hmm. So you're no longer unique. The reason they went to it was because everybody was dressed in a tuxedo when I was doing it and a bright colored tie. Then it went bright colored tie and a vest. Then it was like, no, we need a bright colored jacket. Oh, we have a bright colored jacket. Everybody still looks like they're in a business suit. I'm going to wear shorts with a business tuxedo top. Well, that's funny. I'm just going to wear a bowling shirt and then I'll wear shorts. Now I got shorts and a bowling shirt. Now everybody's there. Yeah. Go in a different direction. Uh, take it. If I were doing a kid's act nowadays, I'd be dressed as a... Oh, I don't know, uh, like brown pants, like a ranger. Brown shorts with a brown shirt with one of those pith helmets on it. You know, Ranger Rob and his magic show. Why? Because when I went and did six fair shows a day, I'd be cool. I wouldn't be hot <laughs> standing around. Yes. And I could uh, go towards the Axtell puppets of monkeys and goofy animals. 
I had a magician, not a magician, a ventriloquist come to me and he said, uh, can you give me some advice? And he was, showed me a picture of him, he was in a tuxedo, and I said, you don't look good in a tuxedo. What you look good in is farm clothes. You look great in overalls. And instead <laughs> of using a, no, I said, instead of using a uh, ATA case, I have a little barn. And then you can open the barn doors and you can take out your pig. And you can take out a cow. And you can take out a chicken. And they would all do things. And then you could sell it to the poultry, to the pork industry, to the beef industry, to the milk industry. And you can do every agricultural fair in North America. And there are a lot of agricultural fairs. You could throw a piece of green turf down, put a white picket front, fence in front of it. And there is your whole wonderful ventriloquism show with farming. And you know what he said to me? What? So what you're saying is, you don't think I look good in a tuxedo. <laughs> yes, and <laughs> here's, you here's how you're going to get 10 years of work. Not just 10 years of bookings, but 10 years of sponsorship on top of it. You'll have four sponsors and, and, and bookings and, and a career completely designed around, and you could end up with a television show and coloring books because it's farm and nutrition and uh, bringing the farm. To, yeah, and he said... So what you're saying is I don't look good in a tuxedo. That you look better in a tuxedo than I do? And, and he just never, ever saw it. Josh Knotts talks about that exact thing in the fair market. He has a two-part two part segment in this seminar, and in the summit. And he has part, he talks about a magician that has an agricultural-themed magic show, and he works nonstop at the fairs. And so it's sad to hear that story, but... I wrote in, another magician and agricultural one from the uh, Farm to Your Kitchen show that uh, it works everywhere that, yeah. uh, on the fair circuit and uh, helped write that show, and I'm very proud of it because it it's works. the same guy. I'm pretty sure it is. It works <laughs> everywhere. Uh, I've written several shows for friends that uh, oh, all you look at is a theme and then develop it. Uh, it it's, it's not a hard thing. In the corporate world, uh, I'll get hired by a company, and I'll go look at the website, and I will see things that are on there. And maybe I'll see just the color scheme. And I'll go, I have props that are similar in color. I'll mm -hmm. bring those ones. And you know, I did one that was burgundy and gold. And I have three or four burgundy and gold props from the day. So I brought them on. I did the tricks. And the CEO came out and said, we especially like that you customize the props to match our corporation. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'm glad you like that. <laughs> uh, I, the princess mummy wrapper, whatever you want to call it, you know, from Tarbell wrapping up. Uh, the center of it, mine, is just a gold center and black commando cloth on the side, but that gold has had more vinyl logos put onto the center of it because I can custom build an illusion just for you. It'll have your logo in the center of it. It'll be, and it's only X amount of dollars. And they're like, yes, we want that. In the world of corporate customization, absolute king. You can do it in so many different ways. In color schemes, you can add something in that's part of their product, uh, or you can go really cheesy. I had one where I literally you know, made the product appear and they were, oh, it's so great. And I'm like, <laughs> no, there's better ways to influence the people. Uh, I built for, uh, you know, the magic squares where there's like so many cards and you add the right-hand corner and you, uh, their numbers from 1 to 64, there's 10 cards. You pick out the ones that have your number on them and I tell you what your number is by adding that little corner one. I made one for a company, Ormed Information Systems, and it was just a, a one-sheet piece of cardboard that you had to cut yourself. So it was like a penny a piece. Mm -hmm. It was just so they had their logo on something so they could have a handout on the edge of the table. And it was about how they can uh, assimilate data faster than any other company. And it was like, well, you pick those four, that's 16. And people, how? So, well, we assimilate data faster than anybody else. It was what they wanted to push as their information. I went, oh, how funny. This is a stupid trick. All your salespeople can do it. And we did it. And it was very successful. A whole year campaign. A year goes by. We're in Atlanta at this big HIMSS conference, one of the largest in the nation for medical information services. And my marketing director comes running through the hall. Sean, Sean, you've got to come with me. Chris, the CEO, come with me. Come with me. Jim, the CIO, come with me. And I'm so we're all running through the hall. We get to the conference center where they're having the big keynote speech. There's 6,000 people in the conference, and there's a slide up on the screen, and it's a copy of our card, <laughs> and the keynote presenter is doing the trick to open yes. his talk. And, and my boss goes, that's our logo. 6,000 people are looking at our logo, and it says we assimilate data faster than data. Oh, my God, that was the best penny we've ever spent. <laughs> it doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah. It has to be thought out. It has to be effective. Uh, and you can do it with just about anything. In, in the kids' market, uh, having a coloring sheet, it's a good thing. But uh, having interactive on your website, now flash animation mm. is cheap. Have kids go there to dress you as a magician, right? Put the tricks in his hand. They can... Or if you're 
and have them undress you. Yeah, too we don't soon. need that. Too soon, way too soon. They're still <laughs> handing out posters with the, the, for the ticket folders has oh. his face on them. No, but you could take a, f a flash video and make it so that, you know, the magician is holding a wand, you put the wand under his hand or it puts a rabbit in a hat, something that draws the kids to go back to the site. Yeah. But having the coloring sheet was never about the kids coloring it. It was about right. the parents putting it on their fridge and looking at that reminder and then the neighbor's parents coming over and going, what was that? Oh, that was the magician. And all the kids going home from that show and putting that little poster up. Uh, I, I have a memento. I do... Uh, uh, Stephen Bargatze's I Hate uh, Kids. It's uh, the greatest <laughs> trick in the last decade. It's the best, worst name ever, best trick ever. <laughs> uh, I Hate Kids is three little tiny leather purses. You uh, allow the child to pick one of them saying there's a dollar in it. And if they get it, they get to keep it. Of course, the kid does find it after you, you know, basically insult them saying, I'm smarter than you. You're just a kid. I'm a professional magician. In the end, they, they find it. The kid leaves triumphantly. I've had the kid hold the dollar up and go, in your face, magic man. And walk up. Crowd goes nuts. You're like, it's other. Sean. Yeah, that's right. It's Sean. I have a name. Dude, then you open know. the other ones and they have like a $20 bill and a $50 bill in them. It's great. Well, I've done it for a long time, but I've done it so many times that I've given away a lot of money because you're giving a <laughs> dollar every time, which is very memorable, but not memorable enough because the kid spends the buck. Right. And so I switched over and I got a coin. They had the minted and they, it has my face on it. Oh, that's yeah. cool. It's got my little face, got my family crest, has uh, two time world champion of magic, has my name, it says my family crest. And what's great about it? is that they get to keep this. It says, uh, this is a magic coin, put it on your pillow when you wake up in the morning, it'll still be there, but your day will be filled with more wonder. That's cool. It's funny, well, by having this, and I give it to a child, they freak out. They, I've never seen the level of, of wonder because to them, it's gold, and it's heavy, it's steel. It's, it's, it's a piece of memory for them. It's a piece of me going home. I learned that in the weirdest way possible, that it's a piece of me. Uh, the joke isn't as good as it used to be. It used to be, then you get the dollar and you go home. And then it goes, and I get to keep my 20 and the 50. And people go, oh, and the kid's like, I want to trade. <laughs> now, I give them the gold coin. They win it and say, this is a gold coin. I had one made. It has my face on it. That's me. And they all laugh. and say, you get a chance to win it. You're not going to win it because I'm a magician. Not just a magician. I'm a two-time world champion of magic. <laughs> I'm smarter than you because you're young and, and you're going to lose. No matter what happens, you understand that. <laughs> I'm terrible. telling you you're going to win, but you're not going to win. And when you don't win, you go back to your seat, you smile, don't cry, or all these people are going to hate you. <laughs> are we good with that? We have a contract. Shake. Awesome. Then I mix them up. You can have this one, that one, or the other one. And they go through this whole thing. And when the kid gets it, and I said, now reach in, look disappointed, and tell them there's nothing in there. It's in there. They dive their hand, they pull, look, crowd goes crazy. And I say, oh, will, will you keep it? Crowd goes crazy. I said, and, and you put it under your pillow. And in the morning when you wake up, Right next to it will be a one to five dollar bill. <laughs> Don't forget to tell your mom and dad what the nice magician said. And remember, Disney magic. Crowd goes crazy. The kid goes back. And now I get my joke. And I say, and I get to keep the 20 and the 50. And it's not funny anymore. It's less funny. Why? Because the kid goes, still worth it to keep the coin. Mm. And I win. I win on two levels. I lose a little bit on the joke, but I win so much on the whole audience going, oh, look at that. He just gave that kid a memento of a Disney cruise that's going to last him a lifetime and he'll never forget it. He'll have it forever. And yeah, maybe three or four years from now, he'll, it'll be totally out of his mind. And he'll pick it up and go, hey, I remember that. Thing. Yeah. It'll be there for a lifetime. That's cool. Blackstone had his uh, 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 little coins that throw out cards that they had. Thurston in his throw out cards. I mean, uh, these, I, I talked to people. I met a man who said that uh, Blackstone Sr. gave him a bunny rabbit, a live bunny rabbit <laughs> at the show. I said, really? Yeah, he used to have a live bunny rabbit and a box of chocolates. I said, you're pretty sure that they switched the live rabbit for the box of chocolates you got the box of chocolates? Oh, that's what they do now. But back then, I got to keep the live rabbit too. Said, really? Good for you. <laughs> it's like, but creating a memory that will last forever, a uh, little memento. And I said, taking a piece of me home. Yeah. And I told you that because... Uh, Having something in the birthday party market uh, is a DVD. Uh, I used to, when, the, when video cameras first came out, I used to say for an upcharge, I'll bring a video camera and I will make you a video and afterwards I will send you the VH copy, VHS copy of the video. And they're like, really? Yes. It was just, I record from the back of the room and then I would transfer it onto a big tape. Uh, first it was a big tape because I had a big, ch -ch -ch -ch. yeah. <laughs> but then I transferred it onto a bigger one and then I gave it to them. And, and that meant I returned 
about three days later, said hello to the mom. Oh, we've given out to all our friends, blah, 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 blah. And now that Saturday, the whole family would sit down and they would watch that videotape again with mm. more friends. And I was basically selling them my commercial that they That's would great. play regularly. Well, you can still do it today. You can give them a DVD that has magic on it where they learn magic tricks, or it can be a DVD interactive where you just perform some magic on it, or it could be you just talking to the kids about how they can be better in their life and how it can be happier. If you're a ventriloquist, it doesn't have to always be magic. It can just be, hey, let's have some fun today. Let's use our imagination. It's a great nation. It's the imagination. But you've got another thing to upsell, saying to the parents, in the goodie bags, you can put my DVD. Or if you don't want to give one to all of them, I can make one magically appear for the birthday child. And they get one. When I did birthday parties back then, even before the video camera, I used to make a rabbit appear or a dove appear. And I got used to doing the bird because it was easy to travel with. And, and I made them appear near the start of the show. And at the end of the show, I'd bring everybody up and I would let them pet the bird. And it was a steady line of just tapping it lightly on the <laughs> back. And I would hold the child's hand to make sure they didn't hurt the bird, and they go through. And then when I got to the birthday person, I would turn them around, and I put the bird on the head of that person, and I would take a picture. <laughs> and they had this picture with the bird. You think that wouldn't be memorable, but I can tell you that I was in a nightclub just recently, and this young, attractive girl looks over at me and smiled. And I said to my wife, that attractive blonde just waved at me. <laughs> she said, yeah, right. I said, no. And I looked over and she smiled and waved again. And I said, she just looked at me again. My wife said, you're imagining things. Well, about <laughs> 20 minutes went by and the girl walked over and said, excuse me, I don't want to interrupt, but is your name Sean? <laughs> it is. <And> she <laughs> said, you did my birthday party when I was six years old. And she said, you put a bird on my head. And I just about died. That's <laughs> awesome. Like, first it was ego letting down, and then it was kind of ego yeah. <laughs> building at the same time. It's like, yeah, she was looking at me because I was the old guy that did her birthday party. But, <laughs> but I framed a way to make a memory. Like, yeah. Right there, something that took an iPhone nowadays. Back then, they had to set up a camera, and shh, the tripod, and shh, take yeah. the picture. They put the black cloth over yeah. their head, they hit the gunpowder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just after the dinosaur walked through the frame. <laughs> Perfect. But nowadays, all those memories can be made so easily. I don't know why every magician doesn't have their own little personal app of fun things that, you know, the kids can play with a couple of games, you know, bounce the rabbit into the hat. If you're in that market, uh, yeah. in, in the corporate market, it goes in a whole different direction. Uh, to produce a souvenir coin for a trade show, uh, to produce a card, a deck of cards, custom printed for the client. And those are only like three bucks. They're cheap. I went on Upwork.com. I looked at a few people's uh, portfolios and I said, I want a playing card that looks like a bicycle deck, but I want it to be gold, not red or blue. And I want it to have, instead of bicycles, I want it to be feathers because I have a lot of birds in my show. And it's awesome. That's my logo's on there and, and it was, I paid a hundred bucks or so for the design. It's a vector file, so if I don't want it gold next year, I can run it as Just red. Run it any color you want to because it's a vector file. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it, you know, they come out to like three bucks a deck. This is the biggest mistake we all do as artists, and it's probably the biggest lesson they can learn, I bet, in this entire series, is that you are not an island, and that nobody, nobody who's successful did it by themselves. You're the first person uh, to be able to say, that I really admire it when you say, one of my mentors, another of my mentors, so many mentors, so many people say, I have a mentor. There should never be a mentor. There should be so many mentors, and yeah. you should be mentoring, because when you mentor, you learn by teaching, and when you have mentors, you're just, absorbing from all these other people's successes and their failures so you don't yeah. lose from it. We all want to be our own costume designer, our own lighting designer, our own music <laughs> I quit editor. that years ago. <laughs> we want to be our own video producer. We want to do everything ourselves, every element. We build the prop, we paint the prop, we then choreograph the prop, we script it all, we do everything. I remember the first time I went to a Bob Fitch workshop and he said, you need to learn to breathe. You know, you don't breathe. <laughs> I said, I'm too busy talking to breathe. <laughs> And, and, and I talk slower than I used to, which is really quite remarkable yeah. when you think about it. But, but learning to have people and ask for help from people is... Well, and look at this whole summit. I don't know, like I really know the cruise ship industry as it is currently, and I know it from my perspective, but I don't know the fare industry like Josh knows it. I don't know the four walling and two walling like Bill Gladwell is a master at it. Uh, if you watch his presentation, he even gives you a free contract with I'm it. I'm looking forward to it. It's 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 amazing. Um, it, you look at the the video, the intro to all of these videos. There's a really nice high end motion graphic mm. from a Grammy Award winning guy, Jim Gravina. And I don't do motion graphics, and so this whole thing is what you're just reflecting on. And 
it's a compilation of everybody's knowledge. It's I can put, village. I can organize it, but I don't have that expertise like you do in, in making your magic memorable. I have similar stories that I've learned because of you. Uh, just like I don't know the fair market like Josh knows it. Now I'm learning and I'm actually kind of have an interest in doing that a little bit. Uh, it's in, a great place to go. It was my next step from the ships when Hannah was getting older, was into the fair. Really? You get used to eating lots of dirt. It's excellent. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but like two wall and four wall and, and, and you know, just coming all full circle here, everybody in these presentations knows more about something than I do. And I bring in 30 experts and now all of a sudden I've got 30 mentors who are now friends that, that uh, many were friends before, but now are closer friends that we can all bounce ideas off of and everybody wins, not only just in that circle of 30, but the thousands of people that will watch this will also grow and pick their mentors to help them. Absolutely, we're in the information age. We should be sharing information with other people and learning from everybody. If you wanna be an island, you're gonna fail all by yourself. If you're surrounded by great people, great ideas, sessions like this, you're going to learn. Yeah. You can't help but learn. And surrounding yourself, uh, the, my hero as a young man was Howard Hughes, uh, a movie uh, mogul, millionaire, aviator. He was the mystery guy for all of us, the recluse. And, and when they said, you know, uh, how did you get to where you were? He said, I surrounded myself with people that were smarter than me. Yeah. That's the secret. If you surround yourself with people lesser than you, you will always be you or become less. If you surround yourself and you, you, you bring in information from every source you can find, and you don't take all information as the gospel. You yes. take it in, you feed through it, you take what you can use and you move on, yeah. and then you share it again. Yeah, I recently had this, this goal because they say you're like the five closest people. You know, your, your circle of friends, you're like those five people. And so I looked at this and I have, I have some great friends and some of them are where I want to be and some aren't. Mm -hmm. And so I really started to focus on what people are doing that are the millionaires that own the race tracks and the helicopters or, and not because like, look, we have, a, we all have a great time together. I'm, you know, I'm not asking them for money. I, I want to learn from them yeah. and I want to be at that next level of my personal self that I can be in business self and that next financial level for me. And I'm not going to learn it learning, uh, you know, taking advice from my friends that are not doing it. Exactly. And so. I, I like what you say about that. I have a friend, his name's David Lyon, he's a producer, and he's 20 years younger than me, and so many years older than me, <laughs> because he's listened to all of the, the mentors. Uh, he, he hangs with the smartest business people. He was named youngest entrepreneur under 30 just recently, and uh, he, he produces massive shows. I was in a show called Superstars of Magic with you know Joseph Gabriel and One Gun, and, uh, as soon as I start naming it, it's wrong to do that because then you lose them all. Uh, Ted Kim. <laughs> it was just a brilliant show. Jay Mattioli. An amazing show to be in. And, and I'm thinking the details that he went through to put it all together. And I said, how? And he says, I don't do it all, Sean. I have graphic artists. I have television people. I have uh, his friend Vincent. Vincent is one of the best stage managers ever who can put together the production. And he says, I have a magic crew of like nine guys that do this. He says, I just have the skills to bring it all together because I looked and went, I'm smart. I'm not going to be everything. I'm going to be the thing above everything and bring you all together. And, and that's why he's so successful. I'm like, yeah, I wish I'd learned that 30 years ago because yeah. you still want to do everything. You want to have your hands on everything and, and don't. Uh, if, if you want to be better in whatever you're going to do, make your magic more memorable and look to other people to help you. That's awesome advice. Part of your success with being memorable has been, I know your backroom sales because people on the ships are still talking about it. Uh, and It's kind of legendary. It, it does, it has become legendary, especially when I'm like, oh, I made 500 bucks this week. And then Whoa. I call you and I'm like, John, guess what? I made 500 bucks this week. You're like, that's, that's great, that's I made awesome. 10,000. So yeah. uh, let's talk about uh, how, not only did you tie that in to make it really memorable and the magic was in their hands, but also if you can share as many of your secrets as you can. Oh, I sold it. About how you made it happen. So, uh, I never planned on selling anything. I never even thought about back room. I was on ships for more than a decade before I did. And then it was a person who got angry. They literally came and poked me in the chest. They said, why don't you have something to sell? The singer has a CD. You should have a CD too. I said, of what, me talking? She kept poking me in the chest. We want to take you home. What? He said, we want to take you home. <laughs> well, at least a piece of you. I said, what, like a finger or a toast? No, we want to take you home. And I was like, I don't get it. She says, hey, you should have a CD. We didn't even listen to your voice tell the stories, just something. And I was like, oh. 
uh, so within That's the next weird. couple weeks, I put together a little CD-ROM that had a couple of magic tricks and a little optical illusion, and, and it had like an MOV file, what you could put onto a CD-ROM, and I sold them for $5, and I was freaked out that I burned 10 of them, and they all sold, and I was like, 50 bucks, and they did nothing really. Yeah. It was like, okay, so I burned a whole bunch more, and they sold, and then I went, I need better content and capacity, and I got a DVD. But I started with a blank DVD that was burnable because I didn't know what I was gonna put on it, and so I experimented on what was good and what was bad. And I had uh, optical illusions galleries, a couple of magic tricks to learn, a downloadable PDF, and a couple of MOV files. And I sold that for $10, and I sold a couple hundred of them in a week. And I was like, interesting. And then I actually went out and got a camera and started producing and doing some interactive magic tricks, putting some live segments that I had recorded, and then I added in not only those things, but some magic tricks they could learn and the optical galleries. And I put on one piece that was really fun and it helped me to sell it. In the end, I did a sleight of hand show. It had never been done on ships. And I was going to be the first guy to do cards as a show. And, and now said, everybody expects everybody it. Everybody <laughs> expects it. It's done in the major showrooms. I was doing it in the Stardust Theater in front of, well, usually about fourteen to 1,500 people. And you know, it only seats 1,000, 1,200 at tops. Well, yeah. But they would sit up in the rows and I would bring kids to sit on the edge of the stage because people would be angry. I would say, they started moving my show to 10 o'clock in the morning uh, on a sea day, going, well, they won't have everybody there. And we'll do it on a sunny sea day, leaving Mexico from uh, Cabo St. Lucas to Los Angeles. And yet they would all come and sit an hour before showtime to get their seat. Because I would say the same thing. At the end of my Shape My Heart routine, I'd say, I hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, later in the cruise, I'm going to have a sleight of hand show. If you like that trick with the cards, I'm going to do an entire show with a deck of cards. Now, there's only 1,200 seats, and there's 2,500 of you on board. So it will be limited seating, and some people come early, and they read books, and they sit around, and you're welcome to do that too. I mm. told them, come. Yeah. And they went, oh, we better be there. And they did. So getting the audience was important. But once I had the audience, if I just said, hey, I'm selling a DVD, then I would sell some. Uh, most guys, three, four hundred dollars is a really good week. Uh, I easily did twenty-five, sometimes thirty-five, as much as fifty-five hundred dollars in a week, uh, because I showed the DVD on the big screen. I said, "I'm going to bring two volunteers up, and I do my sleight of hand show." And about halfway through, I would say, "You know what? I'm going to give you both gifts for coming up." Before I dismiss them, I'd say, "I've got a deck of cards for you, and I've got a DVD for you." And then I would say. Uh, let's take a look at the cards. These are called magic cards. So I didn't want to say Svengali because they find out that a Svengali, Svengali deck sells for five bucks. And so the $20 I was charging for the $56 deck of cards, 56 cent deck of cards might have been a little bit of an upcharge. <laughs> but by calling them magic cards, they were my cards. And the cost to put a wrap on that had my face was pretty cheap for the upgrade of $20. So I would then do a Svengali routine with them. And I, they, I would show them what they did and then I'd make them do it. And they would do it on the other person. And then I'd look at them and say, and you don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> well, they didn't. I said, well, these are the instructions. There's 10 tricks included on it. Don't open them now, but later you'll be doing it. And I mean later, because I went under the theater a couple of days ago, and the guy was in the bar already making money doing tricks with them. And they're like, oh, make money with Subtle it. Subtle little point. Nice little point. Then I would turn to the person and say, this DVD, this has a whole bunch of stuff on it. Some of my favorite parts of the show has some interactive stuff, has some hidden cookies. In, in fact... The video guys in the back have set it up so we can see the DVD. Hey, why don't you play the DVD? And now the opening trailer would spin. They'd see the wonderful graphics. And I go, let's go to, let's go to the optical illusions for a second. And I'd run a couple of optical illusions so they could see them. And they were fun. And I go, wait, 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 go to that one. And they click on it. And I would present Grey Elephant in Denmark. It's an old gag, but every audience loves it. And we would go through it step by step and the whole audience. And they would see on the graphics, on the video, on the DVD. And then it would stop and I'd go and say, and everybody has an animal and a country and a color in their head. And push it and up would come Grey Elephant in Denmark. And I would lose control of the audience for about a minute. <laughs> and then I would have to, I would sit and talk to the two people. Well, thanks for coming up. And here's your DVD you can leave. And there's your card you can leave. And that's, folks, I, I, I'd like to finish the show. Can we all get together again? <laughs> and they'd all come back in. And then I would do the last stuff. And then I wanted to recall it back because they've already been amazed by a DVD that just fooled them. They were amazed by cards, which could probably make them some money, at least popular at a bar. And then I would say, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of the show. Before I go, I, I'm going to just tell you that I have some things available. A lot of people say, Sean, we'd like to take you home with you. And we'd like you to come home with us. And unfortunately, I can't. But you can take a little piece of me home. 
uh, I'm going to be over there right by the edge of the stage. My lovely wife is setting up a table right now, and my daughter would run across the stage and go over. And I say, she's going to be with my little daughter, and we're <laughs> going to sell DVDs. Now, you can come over, and you can buy a DVD, uh, or you can just stare at me. I don't care. <laughs> but, but I'm going to be over there. The DVD, the one DVD is $20. The Svengali, the magic cards are $20. And I also have a DVD that teaches how to do more tricks. Another 20 tricks with that magic deck of cards, it's $20. If you buy all three, I've got a special deal. It's 60 bucks. It's not special for you, but it's special for me. I make a joke about it. And they go, 60 bucks. And they have this high level market. And then I mm -hmm. said, do you know what? I'm only joking. It's only $50. And I'll tell you right now, all the money goes to College Fund Productions which is the name of the company. It really is. And I say, and that's for my daughter. It all goes into her college fund. And I'm really hoping she's going to go to a good college. I was thinking Harvard. <laughs> and then I look at the people, and I get a huge laugh. And I say, go over and help your mom. And remember <laughs> to smile really big for the people. And everybody laughs, and it's fun. And they know it's a joke, and they know that it's part of it. But they do know that the money is going there. I'm being honest. Yeah. And then I would end my trick, and I say, thanks for watching me. I'll be over here if you want to come over and visit. My shows were usually 45 minutes long, and my sale lineup was usually 90, mm. almost double. And I would talk to every single person, take a photograph with them. People would sit in their theater seats for 30 minutes yeah. because the lineup went right out of the theater, and they didn't want to stand outside the theater for fear that the theater doors would close. And then they would stand on the line as the line got smaller until they all went through. And I would visit with every one of them. I shook hands with every one of them. I took photographs with every one of them. And the secret to the selling was the first two or three would go, I'll take a deck of cards. I'll take, you know, a DVD. And then one person would go, I want the special. And I go, the special! Nice and loud and laugh. And the whole crowd would laugh. I go say, he's getting the special. And then I'd sign the special to him. And then the next person went, I want the special too. And I, here's another special. And now it just became a running joke. And 200 people later, buying 30 bucks a piece, you get at least 100 people in a line. And that was $3,000. And Man. it was an easy thing. And I had ones where I made as much as 5K in a single sitting. Because they wanted to take something home with you because it was good, because they got to see it. They saw it in a big screen situation, which was really fun, and because they knew that the funds were going to uh, a good cause, and you were straight up about it. I love magicians who are straight up about it. I love panhandlers that have a sign that say, uh, I need food for beer. I'll give them a dollar. They're not lying to me. When they say right. I need food for money, uh, you know, money for food, I go, you're not going to get food. You're going to get drugs. I'm not giving you anything. But if it says, I need money for beer, you go, here's a buck. At least you were right. honest, right? <laughs> Straight up. Lance Burton had a great line. He used to say, you know, we're selling these magic kits, and afterwards you can buy them. We take all that money we put in a jar, and when we get enough of it together, I buy beer for the crew. <laughs> and the audience, the audience said, that's really great. I saw uh, a performer who said, I sell these CDs. I want to let you know that every dime that from these CDs goes to charity. And then this beautiful woman walked out and said, this is charity. <laughs> if you're straight up, if you got a little gimmick, it'll work. And, and, and it's not so much a gimmick as um, a callback. And it leaves a memory with them. And it's I tying into all of those. who you are and your character. Everyone, like Lance, kind of his Kentucky background, buying totally. beer. Like you can picture Lance in that situation. Totally. Even though he's been classy and perfect, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you picture it, everything you're saying really fits the characters. It does. It, and finding your little niche. It's, uh, it's what uh, street people call their pitch, you know. Yeah. I saw a guy do a pitch that was brilliant when GST, was uh, government service tax, came into Canada. It was an additional 5% on everything. A haircut. You paid 5% more. Ooh, well, that's for health care. So they put this 5% on, and people were angry about it. And the street entertainer was really smart. He said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is my hat. I uh, don't uh, work for this place. Uh, whatever I get, I get from you. And he said, oh, but wait. And he reached into his case, and he pulled out this little toilet. And he put it down, and he opened the lid, and it said, GST. 5%. He says, don't forget. Well, everybody threw a buck or two in there, and they threw change in there. He said, I got like 25 bucks in, yes. in, in the 5% toilet bin. I was like, extra money. He yeah. Says, oh, yeah. I was taking advantage of a social situation that people were kind of protesting and still making fun of, and the toilet added to the moment. So he, he developed it around a character that also was socially conscious for the time. Yeah. And Rick Thomas is another good example too. You know, he was talking about he did this beautiful presentation about his tigers, and then he starts fake crying on stage. He's like, "My tigers got to eat," you know. And then he was like, "Buy my disc." Yeah. So it really fit his character totally. as well. Tigers so. got to eat.
Yep. I like uh, just to tie that whole this whole presentation together, and you know, part of the making your, your magic more memorable is is tying it in with your character, having a character, finding who you are, and developing that first step, and then exploiting it. <laughs> yeah, then exploiting it to death, <laughs> magnifying it, exploiting it, and 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 being it. If you if you decide to make a fake character, you're going to be stuck with it. So try to make it as close to real because audiences will get that, and uh, then develop everything around it. Find yeah. things that mean something to you, build magic around it. It, and it works right from a restaurant, street busker, children's entertainer, corporate entertainer, Las Vegas showroom, cruise ships, the, you name it, big theaters. It all is the same. It's each its own market, but they are all the same. You just have to be unique in your market. Look at what other people do. Don't do it the, that way. Uh, you can look to other markets. We, for some reason, as magicians, always just look at other magicians. Go look at singers. Uh, go look at uh, dancers. Go watch modern comedy shows. Uh, don't watch each other. It's been a common theme, and I want to reiterate that because it's so important. And again, you look at everybody in the summit, and and majority of them have something unique about themselves. They have their own niche or niche. Uh, they they all also bring an outside influence into their show. Yeah. And it's not even, uh, well, I, I won't give it away because he, he mentioned it, I, I don't think it was on camera, but there's there's different things where even some magicians are making fun of magic. Mm. And, uh, yeah. and and they just kind of fake their own things, but from outside resources and not just the magic industry. And it's a great challenge. Take your top five magicians that you, you love and watch and figure out what their outside source is, because they all have one. There's something that they love outside of it that they found a way to incorporate into what they do. Can you give, a, give an example of somebody? Uh, Jeff McBride, All right. Kabuki and martial arts. Uh, absolutely. He, he left. I knew Jeff when he was performing in Montreal, and he was bow tie and big cards, and he left, went to Montreal, uh, went, left Montreal, and uh, went to Japan, studied Kabuki and martial arts, came back, and all of a sudden there was this guy swinging linking rings over his head like they were nunchucks and, and stomping across the stage, and I went... What the, this is awesome, because no one had ever done anything like that. It took this elegant ring routine, which everybody was moving towards Richard Ross and no noise clinks, to swinging them and banging them and doing anything, to thumping your feet in a position. A perfect example of, he had a true love for the martial arts, and that's where he took it. That's um, a great example. David Da Vinci and, oh, I don't know, extreme sports, and uh, <laughs> adrenaline rushing, and the way you present everything you do it on is stage. Like that. <laughs> but it's true. It is. It's absolutely. Yeah. We, all, we all have our little hidden things. Yeah. Well, Sean, this has been awesome. Uh, I hope that everybody out there got as much value out of this as I did. This, there's, uh, there's definitely been some gems in the summit, and, and this is definitely one of those. So before we wrap it up, uh, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but what is one action that people can take right now or this week to get them closer to their goal of 100000 or 500000 or whatever their next goal is by making their magic more memorable? First goal, uh, first step, to your goal is recognize who you are. And that's a long process, but you can start it today. S take a long, hard look in the mirror. Look at yourself and say, who am I really? And what do I want to portray when I'm on stage that's honest and fair? Because nobody takes a moment to look at themselves and honestly appraise themselves. We all look great to ourselves in the mirror. We, we all look 10 pounds thinner than we really are. We all think we're hipper than we really are. And you take a moment, look at who you are, evaluate it, and then build on what you really are to become what you can be. That's where I'd start. An That's honest great. look at yourself. That's great. And make some notes on it. and Oh, definitely. And then build on it. Take those notes and build on it. Don't, don't criticize yourself. I want to make that clear. Embrace who you are. Embrace your inner whatever it is and be it. Be it. Amplify it. Make it more. If you can make it more, you'll make yourself more. And then make yourself more memorable by adding things to it and develop. Bring in the outside sources. Make yourself stronger uh, and ask for help. Like I said, go talk to people and ask them what they think of you. <laughs> be prepared. <laughs> Ask them to be honest with you. Don't accept that, oh, you're a nice guy, you're friendly and fun, you're a really pretty girl, we like you. No, say, no, what are the faults that you see in me and what are the things you like the most about me and uh, what would you change if you had one thing you could change about me? It's going to be hard, <laughs> but boy, well, you'll thank me about a year from now, <laughs> but not right away. And then run with those. Uh, spend my, my teacher gave me the best lesson, one of my mentors, Carl Hemming, he said, uh, always invest 10% of everything you make and spend 20%. 
uh, of everything you make immediately. 10% should be invested immediately before you pay any of your bills and you should spend 20% on your future right now. And he says, mm. with the rest, you can look after bills. You'll find that you can live within your means. But if you don't invest 20% in your future uh, right now and 10% in your future in the future, uh, when the future comes, which will be really fast, you'll be in trouble. Man, wise word. Sean, thank you so much for joining us here. And Thanks for having me. It's, it's been awesome. If somebody wants to reach out to you what, uh, and, and communicate and maybe continue this conversation, can they reach you and how so? Easy to find me. I'm on the web at uh, magicchampion.com. Nothing humble about that. I didn't buy the website, but there's only one C because I couldn't afford both consonants. Apparently, you pay by the letter. See how I made that memorable? M-A-G-I-C-H-A-M-P-I-O-N.com. And my email is sean at magicchampion.com. Awesome. Easy to find. My phone number's even there. I'm the most approachable magician you'll ever meet. <laughs> Call me. We'll have a conversation. It'll last a long time. <laughs> and it'll be one-sided? I don't no. know. <laughs> I'll try to let you talk, too. You'll ask the question, then I'll answer them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. Keep well. <laughs>